So today I'm gonna close my circle because I already did interview with guys from Mexican gangs, from mm. black gangs back in LA, mm. but I never talked to a white boy who spent mm. also a time in Penn. Yeah. Uh, we are not gonna be glorifying the prison system or just the system in general, but we are gonna talk honestly about whatever you can tell us. Mm. And uh, I would like you to be as open as you possibly can. Yeah. But if there is something you don't want to talk about, mm. feel free to just say, you sure, know. Sure. So uh, can you tell me your name, mm. your, let's say, current occupation, mm. and where are you from? Okay. Yeah, so my real name is Steven Testa. Uh, but my artist name, I'm a rapper. That's my current op- occupation. I'm a Christian hip hop artist. Is E.I. the King. And originally, I was born in Houston, Texas. I was raised in Venice, Florida, but now, like my hometown where I reside, is Tampa, Florida. Okay. How was your childhood growing up? Who would you be if I would meet you on the street, let's say, in age of ten? Age of ten would be in Venice, Florida, playing for Pop Warner football, captain of the football team, captain of the defense, and I was an athlete, man. And that was my world. That was my life. So that was like the highlight. But I think like the the subconscious internal reality that was going on that little boy then was a fatherless kid who felt worthless rejected and was looking for purpose and my outlet was football you know what i mean that's super common yeah everyone i have ever interviewed told me that they are in from fatherless family and that's mm. a big problem that the majority of those people they get into the system because they are looking for some male figure mm-hmm. in their life you know acceptance belonging exactly yeah. so do you think if you would be from a regular family mm-hmm. mom and dad that your life would be different or it do you think it would still turn up the way how it did uh, i mean definitely it'd be different like it's different for me a little bit because i i do have a father uh but my mother divorced him when i was three and she took me and my sister from houston here to florida so he's just like an absentee father he was mm-hmm. never there mm-hmm. you know i see him maybe a couple weeks out the year if that mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think my life or anyone's life would be different because I think that's probably like the healthiest, you know, environment for any child is the family unit, you know, a strong mother and father, a core family. And I think like psychologically, I'm sure like scientifically proven, you know, through psychology, that's probably like the most healthy environment any child can have. So yeah, for me, like not even being able to identify as a kid, but maturing throughout the years, I can look back and even as a grown man, I can see my biggest flaws and weaknesses and wounds stem from like upbringing of always feeling less than mm-hmm. or always looking for acceptance or always feeling rejected. And I think that ultimately stem from feeling rejected from my father, feeling abandoned from my father, feeling like he didn't care. You know, so I think all those are like psychological traumas. You know what I mean? A child who's raised in that environment, you know, mm-hmm. experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very common in America. It's actually mm-hmm. it's actually getting worse and worse by decade. Mm-hmm. I was actually checking some uh, statistics like recently and they're saying that 49 of a black 49% of a black kids are growing up without debt in the That's United crazy. States. And when it comes to Hispanics, it's not, I think it's 29% and it's almost the same for whites. Mm. So it's getting significantly worse decade by decade. And that's probably like what is also leading into problems we are having yeah. right now. So when was your turning point when you kind of like felt like, okay, I'm not a kid. I have to stand, stand up to the like a adulthood. Like mm-hmm. what is around what age was that? Was it like 13 or? Yeah, I would say that was definitely probably at 13, 14. There was traces beforehand where I began to be influenced by street culture, uh, just predominantly not only through hip hop and through media, um, but like a close friend on the football team, his older brother was a drug dealer. So me being a natural born leader on the football field and like I enjoyed the fulfillment and the purpose that I had from people following me and listening to me. So I saw like, the street glory in my friend's older brother's life. Mm-hmm. So those were like tastes of the street that got me interested. Mm-hmm. So, but I would say like the threshold of like me actually like beginning to enter into a life of crime and street lifestyle was probably at the age of 13. So smoking marijuana, drinking, uh, my grades started, you know, taking serious effect. I was fighting a lot, um, just not paying attention to school, mm-hmm. partying. And um, when I started smoking marijuana, I realized like not only can I enjoy getting high, but I'm paying for this. 
So I, I knew like all my front friends and like older friends sold drugs and they sold marijuana. So it's like I can sell marijuana, I can sell weed mm-hmm. to supply my own habit, mm-hmm. and that's what began to get me introduced in uh, a life of selling drugs. Mm-hmm. Realized to where not only I can make money and I can enjoy it, but I can have a position, mm-hmm. I can have like authority, I can have you know uh, that street glory yeah. Yeah. in the street life. And know? that was something you were looking for some certain validation, exactly, because you are not getting it from the family. I'm assuming, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. How about like, what type of drugs can you actually get here on the street? Like, what is the the street drug here out here? Is it a weed? Because you know, in Cali, mm. weed is legal. You go to to store to buy it. It's yeah. not a drug, yeah. you know. So, but here, what is considered a street drug? Uh, I think it all depends, like in what city and what state you're in. But I think like all the drugs and culture are prevalent. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Whether it be from, you know, marijuana to cocaine to ecstasy Crystal to molly meth. to meth. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Crack. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff you like know, that. fentanyl, heroin. That's this and it's, 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 drugs are everywhere. Did you work you know? just with uh, weed? Um, no, my predominant um, drug that I saw was cocaine. And okay. Crack. Where's the where is the majority of the cocaine coming from? Is it like from like the islands in Caribbean or somewhere like or? I, I can't talk about that. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I was just trying. No, no, no. <laughs> good, yeah. Um, so. 13 was a turning point. How many years did you enjoy this type of lifestyle before you got into first problems? Um, I think with I, law enforcement, that's where yeah, I Yeah, I think um I was fighting a lot in high school and I got expelled from from uh, public high school. I think the beginning of my 10th grade year. And I went to a second chance school. And I kept getting in trouble and I got expelled from there. But with the day that I got expelled from the second chance school, a cop was like following me and trying to stop me. And I ran. No, no, I got a battery charge from high school. Yeah, so I think that was my first like crime, you know, to where I was like entered in the teen court. But then I got kicked out of teen court because of another, you know, arrest from the second chance school from like fleeing and eluding, running from the police. And it just continued, man. I kept getting in fights. But also too, I was on like juvenile probation. Mm-hmm. So I kept failing drug tests from smoking. Uh, I had curfews. I kept violating my curfew. And I would just be like in the streets or out and I'd have drugs on me and the police would try to stop me and I'd always run. You know, so I was constantly getting like existing arrest charges and battery charges. And all that was happening in Sarasota County? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that, that this county seems to me so innocent, but mm. but obviously I don't know much about the county mm-hmm. because I can't imagine things that you are describing that are taking place mm. here. I can imagine in different in, in every different city or whatever, but here it seems to me like it's so calm, nothing is yeah. going on. So this is definitely like a new information to me, pretty like yeah. uh, like eye opener. Okay, so when you were going through all that, like what was your mom like doing about all that obviously she wasn't probably my mom was going crazy bro she's (laughs) going nuts right (laughs) listen shout out to my mom that's my og (laughs) i love her to death she's held me down through everything and um looking back that's one of my greatest shames is this dragging my mom through the mud man because i remember my mom would be at every court date picking me up from every juvenile program visiting me in juvenile programs and juvenile detentions man they was just eating my mom alive you know and she would be crying um You know, but she would try her best to discipline me as a kid. And uh, but she was always working. She was a single mother, mother raising two kids, me and my sister. So my grandmother like predominantly raised us and raised me too. Uh, my grandfather died when I was like nine or ten. So um, but I was just a young, wild kid, man. And uh, despite them yelling or trying to ground me, I'm just sneaking out and running and just staying the night at my friend's house or just always, always gone. Um, and obviously not only was hurting my mother, she tried to discipline me. She tried to, you know, smack me around or, you know, mm-hmm. ground me or whatever. But I think it got to a point to where she was chasing me for so long that she finally began, I think, to realize, you know, she wasn't like giving up on me, mm-hmm. but she was beginning to realize because I was like, I was really starting to like be out of the house mm-hmm. around like 15 and 16. Besides being gone on juvenile programs for like six to nine months at a time. Uh, but whenever I would come back and transition home, I was I was never home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I maybe like show up to eat or shower, but I was always like in the streets or at friends' houses, girls' houses, and things like that. So I think she was just allowing me to run my course, you know, to where she would still always 
you know, love on me and be there for me and lecture me and like, you know, tell me truth when I needed to hear it. But I think, you know, after so many like brief couple of years of trying to chase me and discipline me and prevent me from destroying my life, I think she just came to the realization that like I was going to have to learn the hard way. And I remember like my 18th, my 18th birthday, the day of my birthday, she called me and she didn't even call me to say happy birthday. She called me and said, I'm, I'm not bonding you out. Oh, wow. And what I'm a, like, geez, thanks, Molly. Like, thanks what a for gift. the happy birthday. Yeah, but she was just letting me know. Like, I know you're going to jail, adult jail this time. It's no more it's no more juvenile. It's no more kid stuff. You're going to adult jail. I'm just letting you know, as your mother, I'm not bonding you out. You know? So it, it was to the point where it was just tough love. And she was just... Well, that's heavy. Yeah. That's, that's heavy. I mean, what is the worst thing you can hear from mom than mm. when she's calling you on your 18th birthday and telling you, It's on your own. Mm. Like, I'm not helping you anymore. You mm. are 18. That's it. Mm. Or it's crazy. Do you think once you get to juvenile system, the chances you are going to continue a life in an adult population mm. jail are pretty high? Oh, yeah, of course, man. Statistics are statistics for a reason, bro. And, like, I've never, like, done a case study on the numbers. I hear about them yeah. all the time. Because yeah. while you're incarcerated, you have to take these dumb classes and you hear about it. Um, but from firsthand experience... Like, this is, like, my life experience. Like, everyone who I knew, like, in second chance schools and third chance schools and juvenile programs, like, to this day, like, there's barely anybody who's actually out. Like, I remember, like, we graduate from juvenile programs to adult prison. And as we grow up in prison, like, there's guys in the prison, like, I would see, like, I remember, like, doing, like, juvenile time with them in juvenile facilities mm -hmm. if they're not dead. And some of them have life sentences, 30 years, 60 years. And that's where it all started from. We can look back and we can trace like like we started in juvenile programs. And we just continued to live a lifestyle of crime and the street life that led to mass incarceration. So pretty much like the, the penitentiary is not uh, going to make people better or innocent. They're mm -hmm. just going to keep adding up the heavy situations of their life and just keep piling them up one by one and eventually you're gonna be paying a price for it because mm. you are around the the people who are up to no good mm. since young age so mm. that's probably like why so many people fail by living better or i don't want to say better because what's better really right mm. but they fail to live like let's say normally after mm. just like they get out from the juvenile because it's mm. impossible because of the experience they already went through as a kid mm -hmm. in the juvenile hall. So how they can be better as an adult, right? It's not yeah. gonna make you any better. Yeah. Um, how did you process that the fact that you can spend their majority of your life being just locked down? Mm -hmm. Like when you actually realize you are facing this type of reality, did you actually even realize that? Like mm -hmm. when you were 18 and you said, them i'm i'm pretty screwed like mm -hmm. i'm gonna go to adult population and mm. there's no playing around i'm assuming right mm -hmm. how did you process that um i went to the prison like you said the first time when i was 18 and i was sentenced to two and a half years so in the state of florida they um try to protect you know like young adults to where like if you're under the age of 25 and you're sentenced to adult prison to where they'll send you to what's called like jit camp It's adult prison, but it's from the age bracket from like 18 to 25. Uh, but it's also known as gladiator school because like even whenever you're 18 to 25, like nobody wants to go to JIT camp, you know, because it's gladiator school. So it's nothing but like fighting all day and, you know, gang affiliation and gang violence and extortion. And it's just crazy, you know, a whole bunch of young men who come from a life of crime, you know, and it's a... Uh, They're all like up on the, on the same spot. Yeah, it's completely yeah, yeah. unnatural environment at all. Yeah, yeah. No women, no parents, nothing. Just a uh -huh. bunch of guys stuck, filled up with testosterone, aggressive, uh -huh. like... And, uh, th th you know, this is the r harsh reality that I cannot even imagine. Mm -hmm. How can you survive in prison like that as a first-timer? What are, like, mm -hmm. the, key th the key things you have to do as a first-timer? Yeah. I would say, man, it's different for everybody everyone's prison experience is different. And just like, you know, sometimes I think it's a challenge for people who've never experienced like incarceration, what it's like, because, you know, we only get like snapshots of like what's on TV or people's stories. But even when you hear people's stories, everyone's story is different. Just like out here in society is that like, how do you live life? Like, bro, you can live life like a plethora of ways. 
So same thing in incarceration. While incarcerated, you can live your incarcerated time a, a, a vast majority of ways. And also it's based upon like what state you're in, what prison you're at, what dorm you go to. Okay. Uh, but I would say this like some core like similar traits I think it boils down to. Um, man, is respect and uh, just how you carry yourself. And one thing about prison, I think over a long period of time, especially like when you grow up in prison and you do like years, man, like nothing gets past you. You know, like I think out here in society, like I can kind of, it's the transition has been different, but I feel like even like coming home from prison after a long period of time, people who've done prison time, we can even come home to an advantage because like we read body language, tone, texture of people's conversations, you know, their eyes. In the moment someone walks in a dorm, just like subconsciously, like you're profiling them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you have this survival. I mean, you, you know have, what I mean? And plus you have all this time in the world. You're sitting there. So you are analyzing people, like yeah. reading, trying, trying to read them. Yeah. So respect. And and also too, man, it's like you can tell when people are scared, you oh, yeah. know? So I think <laughs> that, you know, predators can prey on the weak. Ultimately for me, Like I, for me personally, like it was nothing but the favor of the Lord protecting my life. And I've always been very social. I've always been like, you know, popular in school mm-hmm. and even like in prison. So like the big gang leaders, like those are always like my homeboys, you know what I mean? And things like that. And, yes. and people who had influence, even though I wasn't living a crazy chain gang lifestyle, running around stabbing people as like some savage, but still just by the favor of God ultimately and just how I was living. Um, but also too, just because I think of my past and my street upbringing, I, I knew how to be assertive, mm-hmm. to be aggressive mm-hmm. and to like draw boundaries and lines to where like, I'm not pussy. You're not mm-hmm. going to take advantage of me. You're not going to yeah. talk to me in any type yeah. of way. Yeah. And I think just like in that type of environment, you have to, you have to um, be assertive mm-hmm. and you can still be like a, you know, a follower of Jesus and honor and glorify God yeah. in incarceration, yeah. but still know like, okay, there's boundaries, there's lines. There's a line. It, it's, it's respect, man. I would say in a nutshell, the core essence of doing life in prison or doing years in prison or spending time incarcerated mm-hmm. is being a man. And what I mean by being a man is just like, you can't, in that type of hostile environment, you can't be a pushover, but you just got to be respectful, bro. Mm-hmm. You respect other people and you need to expect and demand respect as well. You know, people around the globe, they know that US prison system is racially divided. Mm. Um, I talk, as I said, I talk to blacks, I talk to Hispanics, I never talk to anyone white. Mm. Can you tell me more about your side of the story of prisons being racially divided? Mm-hmm. You guys are minority there right mm. yeah wise facts. yeah there's yeah. just few of you right compared mm. to the others you are outnumbered on mm. pretty much in every prison mm. right i'm just assuming yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely <laughs> um, minority can you can you tell me more about that how does it work yeah, yeah i would say um racial division it's it's there just like it is in society uh and once again man i think it can boil down to what prison you're at And the type of vibe, you know, because like for instance, I can give an example, right? Okay, interesting. In a dorm, in a prison, it can have a good vibe to it. They say there's like 80 people in an open bay dorm or whatever, or two men cell, 90 something people, and it can be pretty laid back. But all it takes is one person to get moved into that dorm who has influence. And if that one person who has influence, he may be like a you know gang affiliated or whatever, or he could just you know just have influence where he's a leader and people follow him. And if he's aggressive. And if he's hostile and always stirring up conflict, he can change that whole atmosphere of that dorm. So the same thing when it comes to prison, you know, it, I think it kind of depends upon like the influence, the influencers and the leaders there to where it can be laid back, it can be chill or it can be hostile. Mm-hmm. And I think it depends upon who the influencers are. So, yeah, there's racial division. But once again, too, I'm white. But I've always predominantly identified with like, you know, the black community, you know, just, you know, being from street culture and predominantly having a majority of black friends. Mm-hmm. So like I was never tempted or even like looked at even in prison as just like a regular white boy, you know what I mean? Who so, may be like okay. affiliated with like, you know, Aryans or the mm-hmm. white supremacies or supremacists. Or yeah, like. because... um i mean, I, I was reading a bit about it, and mm. um, and also I've been told that like the ABs they usually roll with like the the Hispanics that they have like alliance and stuff like that, mm. but they never are friendly with the blacks. 
Mm. So that's not like 100% guarantee in every prison. It it can depend, like mm. it can vary as you as you just said, because that's pretty mm. new information to me mm. that you can have, let's say, black friends as well. Mm. Because normally, like I've been told that you cannot even, let's say, eat with the, by the same table with them mm-hmm. because they will not allow you. Your own people will not allow mm-hmm. you and they will also not allow you. Mm. Is that... Um, as far as like, the details of gangs and affiliations, I'm not going to ever speak on nobody okay. else. That's But when it comes to like just the broad overview of my experience in mm-hmm. the Florida prison system is uh, I think at the end of the day, even despite like affiliation or people's bylaws and how they view, you know, different types of people groups... I think at the end of the day, the majority of like the living standard was like, it doesn't matter what set you're in or what your view is when it comes to gang affiliation or where you stand at regardless. Like if you are a man, and you know what I mean? If you handle yourself mm-hmm. like a man mm-hmm. and like you respect me, I respect you. We can see eye to eye, like you can be cool. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's not okay. to where like, I'm not even going to speak to him or they're not even going to speak to you. You know what I mean? So I don't think it's that, you know, um, I think it can be yeah. at times and at places based upon what's going on in the yeah. culture, of course. But I think that's not like, I don't think that's like a golden law and well, standard that is at all times. Because you had uh, drug charges, right? Mm-hmm. Those are in US prison system, I would say pretty common. And mm-hmm. they are not the heaviest charges you can have. It's mm-hmm. not murder. It's not kidnapping. It's not armed mm-hmm. robbery and those kind of things. So maybe if you would be around people who have only this type of charges, maybe it would be like more crazy, right? Well, in Flo- first of all, I don't have drug charges. I have all violent crimes. Violent crimes. Yeah. Um, and second of all, in the state of Florida, they don't house people based upon their crimes. It's based upon like how whenever you get intake and your like behavior throughout your incarceration is based upon your housing. So you're so, getting the points, right? Once you are uh, waiting for like the, the the prison, you are getting like your point systems figured out, right? Yeah, and it all depends too, like on your past. Like I had like an escape DR from like work release, my first bid. So that always kept me from going below medium custody. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I first got that escape DR, I was always around like you know, lifers, you know what I mean? And I only had like, and I could only have like months to go. I remember like I messed up at work release and I got sent from JIT camp to work release from work release to adult, adult prison at like 20 years old. And I only had six months left and I'm going in a dorm and have a roommate who has 40 years and everyone in the dorm has life. But that's not based upon my charges. It mm-hmm. was based upon my housing level, and that can fluctuate and change. Well, what yeah. was what was his, his crime that he got 40 years? Um, I think it was like a, I think he got PR and I think it was he was accused of robbing a gas station with a firearm mm-hmm. and it was just because of his previous record got it, it that got the it, point got system it. had him hung. So can you take me briefly through your through your charges so we kind of know like what get you this yeah. total of like 12 years? Yeah, so f- I went to prison the first time at the age of 18 and those charges was like originally aggravated battery, battery with a deadly weapon and robbery with the weapon. Uh, they got dropped down to just simple battery and simple robbery. So I did 30 months. And um, so I, I did 30 months, like it was a two and a half years. I got out for eight months and I went back to prison again the second time for a high speed chase. Mm-hmm. It was like fleeing, and like aggravated fleeing and eluding, something like that. It was really the violation of probation mm-hmm. that sent me back to prison the second time. Mm-hmm. And I did two years on that bid. And then I came home again for six months. And then when I went back to prison the third time, I got nine years, in which was aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon on a law enforcement officer, aggravated battery on a civilian, and fleeing and eluding. Damn, that's heavy. Yeah. So from the ages of 18 to 31, I've done over 12 years in prison, and I've only been in society for 14 months. How do you feel between, like, among all those people? like just on the street like how do you feel like this freedom like this mm-hmm. like just ability to decide when you want to eat what what you want to eat with who you want to talk to like where mm-hmm. you want to go like i mean it must be it must be pretty new to you right like mm-hmm. 12 years being told what to do and what hour what to wear mm-hmm. you know how to respond yeah. like there are rules right you have to follow mm-hmm. either prison rules or like the guys who are living with you they they create mm-hmm. rules mm-hmm. and now they're Look around. People don't know anything. They don't yeah. even. They don't know anything. <laughs> like mm. there's no rules. <laughs> mm. So how do you feel about that? As far as this being free, yeah. In general, uh, man, it's amazing, bro. Um, it's undescribable. You know what I mean? And uh, 
I have more content and more things rolling out regarding my release. So I don't want to give too much away. Got it, got uh, it. But just the experience, man, praise God. It's amazing of God not only delivering me from mass incarceration, um, but seeing how like that my lowest low in life throughout all 12 years in prison, that God used that to transform yes. me from who I was to who I am now and what he's doing in my life, man, is just amazing. I I can see it in your eyes that you have the you have the will to live. Like mm. you know you already lost so much of your time that mm. your remaining time that you have on this earth you want to use as a, as a good time. Mm. I can see it. Like yeah. because you are like let's live, you yeah. know? Let's yeah. let's not waste any more any more time. Mm. Well, I I really like to to uh to hear that, but let's go back a little bit to to mm. the prison. You told me you've been in eight or nine different prisons yeah and do you have one that was probably better than let's say the rest of them was mm -hmm. that one that was sticking up really like when it comes to i, I don't know the inmates or uh, the guards or the mm. regime during a day like how does it mm. is there one that is sticking up yeah yeah i would definitely say uh columbia ci that was probably like one of the highlights to, uh, that's the one we actually have open right here yeah That's the one. Damn. So this was your reality. Mm, yeah, that's a uh, two man cell. So I was in open bay. So you were in uh, in the dorms, right? So uh -huh. it's like, but those are the fields you're spending your time at. Mm -hmm. Man, that's crazy. I can't even. Now that South Car South Carolina did something different, but yeah, this one is this one is it Columbia Correctional Institution. Mm -hmm. What kind of memories does it bring when you see it back then? Do you have like some? Yeah, yeah. The reason why it sticks out for me so much is uh two things. Well, several things, but like the two biggest things is um that environment. Columbia has always been known as one of the most like hostile, dangerous prisons in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so throughout my experience in prison, whenever like Jesus completely transformed my life and God gave me purpose, and I discovered who I was as a man. And my identity, God began to use me, you know, first and foremost, transforming my life, but also as well helping mentor other men by communicating the gospel and specifically to reach those who are still like actively involved in street culture and street lifestyle. Mm. So like that was like a savage institution, you know, it was going down, you know, a lot of stabbings, a lot of violence, a lot of, you know, gang, you know, wars and things like that. But from my experience in prison, that was always my favorite place to do time because Uh, that's where I felt God was moving the most and where God would use me the most mm. to where I could come alongside the men who are gang affiliated and going through crazy drama, not just in prison, but just in their life and get to know them and mentor them and mm. point them to Jesus and really just seeing God move and work throughout the facility. Mm -hmm. Like I remember like we would do ministry outreach on the rec yard under the pavilions and there's gang meetings popping off all under the pavilions. And we're out there in the middle of the rec yard, me and all my dogs, and we out there preaching the gospel. But not like in a really lame, like christian -y, yeah, corny yeah. way. Like two pastors. But right? yeah, but we're really using like street illustrations. You know what I mean? Like, boom, lay down, lay down. Like, and get people's attention and they listen and we'll use that illustration to like have a message about street culture, but ultimately how God can redeem you and God has more for you than that. Mm -hmm. And the boldness that you had in the streets to hold ARs and lay people down, like that, that that's a boldness that God wants us to use to glorify him and to represent the kingdom and the gospel. So anyways, uh, it was just in that season of being at the institution. I think I was there for like three years, maybe three and a half. And I just remember that like God gave me vision there mm -hmm. for my release. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um he really used me there in my in my identity and my purpose. And I saw God move in a lot of lives of men. And my one of my best friends was shot and killed whenever I was at the institution. And I remember being there when I found out. And it was through his death that God began to bring forth life and give me vision for my release because he died in the streets. He was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, that was a reason why. There was many other reasons why, but that was like, you know, a vocal point of the reason why of God was giving me vision to get out and to come back to the streets, to reach street culture, to re reach those who are still in that lifestyle, 
but to help them find a way out. It's like how God transformed my life and, and delivered me out, even while I was still incarcerated, mm -hmm. would transform my you life. You already start to work on your transformation. Exactly. Is is the working out, let's say, uh, or studying, uh, let's say, reading the books, is that mandatory between you guys? Uh, or no, 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 no. I think for youth, for like if you're like under 18, if you don't have your high school diploma or GED, it's mandatory, I think, or maybe under 21. Um, but not for like adults, like people above that. No, but also too there. That's the second highlight I was gonna mention. Man, I got my college degree there. Oh, really? Yeah, I got my yeah. associate's degree, man, in general education. Nice. So that was a huge opportunity, and it's actually through that experience because it's like a federal um government experiment, a pilot program. Because mm -hmm. throughout the nation, they took away the Pell Grant for those who are incarcerated in the '90s. So they're like, you know what? Recidivism is crazy. People keep getting out and coming back to prison. Just try and see. I think they chose 16 states in the nation, and in Florida, they chose 65 inmates initially. And I, by the favor of God, I was chosen to be one of those 65 inmates. Nice. Yeah. So um, they like, you know, wanted to see if they gave us the opportunity to get our college degree, if they continue to follow us when we get out to see if if it's gonna be better for us not to come back to prison. Well, I I like to see such a things like coming mm -hmm. from let's say state or government level, like yeah. actually that are, at least they are trying to do something. That's where re that's that's really where rehabilitation is like yeah. gonna take place. Because sadly, man, I mean, like it's so the system is so corrupt. You can just yeah. do time and do dead time. You're just warehoused. So it's really based upon the individual, mm -hmm. like if you're gonna be rehabilitated. And that's how it should be, of course. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like you can't force nobody to change. But sadly, there's not much opportunity in, yeah, it's in very like hard. yeah, in the system mm -hmm. to get education yeah. or to get trades. You know what I mean? Or just to fit back to the society because if you will tell them you are a felon. Mm -hmm. There, there, people are looking over your shoulder. And they're like, eh, "Yeah, we don't even talk to this guy." You know, mm -hmm. it's I talk to a few of them, and my based my, on my opinion, pretty good guys. Mm -hmm. You know, like they did what they did, but they paid for it. You know, mm -hmm. and now they are fine. And uh, one of those guys that I actually interviewed seemed to me like that. Also, his boss that I knew just over the phone, but I talked to him for quite a while. He told me like he has a keys to my company. Mm -hmm. he's there first he opens it i don't have to worry about anything he's very responsible and i think that comes from the people who actually been in such institutions they know how precious the time can be mm -hmm. uh that's my next thing i'm kind of glad that you mentioned it because i was actually about to ask you if there are some certain programs you guys mm -hmm. can fit so pretty much you just answered my question that was mm -hmm. that's pretty cool but how how fast the time goes in there you said that you mm -hmm. are in there for three years mm -hmm. i can't even imagine that mm -hmm. How fast time goes in prison? Yeah, um, the key is, man, like, it's different. Like, when you're short time, and like, I remember I was 18, I was doing two and a half years. Man, my, my world came to an end. <laughs> I'm 18 years old. My baby mom was pregnant with twins. You know, I'm in confinement for fighting, and I get pictures in the mail of my kids just being born. You know what I mean? Like, yo, that's crazy. You know what I mean? Like, that's freaking, like, life-shattering. So as an 18 year old who's in confinement, who still has two and a half years ago, whose children were just born and I'm not gonna be able to see them until like they're a year old. Like, yo, that two and a half years seems like centuries, you know? So of course it's long. Uh, but then like whenever you catch a bid, like a big bid, like my third bid was like a nine piece. It's different, like the second bid is like, all right, I violated probation, I gotta do two years, yeah. but I already did it the first time. It's like, all right, it's, it's, like it's a vacation. Thing. I'm gonna yeah. go down here and lay down. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm gonna lay down, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna try to get focused again. Uh, and it, it's, it went by, you know, it kind of went by. I wouldn't say fast, but it went by. But then when I caught the nine piece, nine years, I'm 23 years old. My kids are four, and that's got to send us to nine years in prison. And, of course, at first, emotionally, it's like, man, I'm going to miss their entire their childhood. So that's emotionally, like, you know, shattering and all of that. But when it comes to, like, the time and the speed of it, I think whenever you catch a big bid, like when you catch time, and that nine, that nine piece ain't nothing. You know, like, if you if you flex nine years in prison, like, you don't even want to talk about that. These boys doing, like, 25's a bid. They're not going 40. home. Yeah, yeah, or, or they're not going home at all. At least you got a release date. Eight. You know, so the I think the longer time that you have, sadly, like the faster time goes by because you're not even looking at the date. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, you're focused on prison. I'm focused on the menu changing or how come they haven't opened up the rec yard yet, you know, or or what I'm doing in my life while incarcerated. I'm not even really thinking about the streets. 
But whenever you have like a couple years, it's like, all right, you're still attached to everybody from the street, yes. still trying to call yeah. and get yeah. mail. It's because you like you're looking forward to going home. But whenever you have like a, a longer bid, it's like yeah. you're not really focused on your release too much. Well, how about like when you know you're getting out, let's say mm. in two years or four years or whatever mm. the number it may be. Uh, are there guys who are there for, let's say, for 40 or life? Are they trying to like use you in a way that would lead to situation that you would actually get some extra years? Mm-hmm. Are and, they trying to use yeah, do that? Yeah, that's like always like a chain, I think like a chain game, like myth. You know, like yeah. you hear like even whenever you first, and it's true to a degree. Like I remember as a jit going to prison for the first time, like old convicts tell you like, man, don't tell nobody how much time you got. You know what I mean? Because of course, yeah, bro, like people got life sentences and there are some people who are like, well, not everyone who has a life sentence like hates on the person going home. No, of course not, bro. There's a lot of my dogs who got life sentences who are like rejoicing when their dogs go home, who was like crying on my shoulder, excited for me going home, that I have another opportunity at life. And they're sending me out with the best wishes, you know what I mean? And and loving on me and want to see me do great because it's family. I did years with these guys, you know what I mean? But of course there are maybe a select few who have a large majority of time Mm -hmm. and they're broken and they're hurting and they're bitter and they see other people going home and rather than being like rejoicing you know maybe it could cause them to like want to prevent that or stop that or so yeah like you hear stories like that but i wouldn't say it's too common but then again too at the end of the day you know i think it's based upon like who you are and how you did your time and your relationships Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's that's not like a. Um, Can you explain me what does the paperwork mean, if you know? Oh, you talk about like let me see that paperwork. Yes. Oh, like yeah, right whenever you get to prison. Yeah. I would say right when you get to prison, but um, but honestly too though, bro, like <laughs> there's a large majority of people in the prison who have snitched. You mm. know, so uh, it's not like everybody in the chain gang like. If like they're snitched, they're getting like you know wet up immediately because there's a large like there's a large population who like made statements on their co-defendants or who like mm-hmm. told on somebody. So I think if that was the case, then a lot of people would be getting stabbed because honestly, like from what you hear mm-hmm. and like you know, because you get to know people from different cities mm-hmm. and no one's gonna tell you that unless you're real close to them. Mm-hmm. But then you hear from their homeboys from the same city and they'll tell you the backdrop of the story. But I think you hear about that most when they're gang affiliated okay. or when they have influence. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Because like, if you're just like a regular, like neutron, mm-hmm. like no one really cares if you snitch or whatever, like people may shame you and laugh at you about it, yeah. you know, and people may not trust you when it comes to a legal activity in the Got system, it. but for the people who really matters most or for the people who are like, you know, gang affiliated and like that can expose you and not like you're at jeopardy. But the, the checking the paperwork, that's like a real thing. Once you like uh, arrive to the system. Uh, nah, no, nah. I mean, like it, it, depend, it depends, <laughs> it depends bro. where yeah. it depends, man. Yeah. It all depends upon the yeah. person and the situation and like who you are. Nice. You know what I mean? Like if you're like, if you're from a certain, if you're like, if you're, if you're banging, if you're gang banging, And like people catch, but I don't know, man, the system's tied up to where they all know everything anyways. Well, after so. 12 years in that system, have you meet some people who came to that system with uh, some like bad charges when it comes to kids? Oh, of course, bro. Yeah. Really? Of course. Yeah. How common is that in prevalent, in man? Really? There's a huge population in prison that has sex crimes. Of course. What happens to people like that? Oh man, it's sad, bro. I mean, I was... I don't want to say I say it's sad because like I try to view everyone from the mercy of God. You got it. Um yeah. but man, I've seen some some of the heinous things I've seen in prison has been men preying upon, you know, sex offenders. And uh of course I have kids, bro. You know, so that hits home to me whenever like you hear about people like touching and molesting or hurting children and things like that. But at the same time though, just you know, from a Christ center view. It's not my position to condemn another man. It disgusts me, and I disagree with it totally, of course. Um, but then that's that's from a Christ center view. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. But then you got to realize that the large majority of people in prison too, they're looking at it from like a street view yeah. or like a savage yeah. animal view. So uh, yeah, it can be people like I know some people like that's how they do their time. They do their time by preying upon like you know sexual predators and just like freaking torturing them and extorting them and i think it really just boils down to because like they're hurting and they're going through something and they just choose them as the outlet 
Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Or maybe something happened to them as a kid or their yeah, kids, yeah, yeah. and they're sure, just choosing sure, to take it out. Sure. But yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff. Don't you prison. think it's crazy that uh, in the U.S. right now there's so many prisoners locked locked up for let's say a weed position or something mm. like that? And nowadays it's like legal. Legal, yeah. Let's say in 20 plus states, or mm. I don't actually know in how many exactly, but let's say it's you can order it in California. And they will drive it to your home like a pizza mm-hmm. f- in fancy packages or whatever, you know? Yeah. I'm actually going to have a guy here who is who run this business back in Cali for 10 years. So I'm mm-hmm. kind of excited what he's going to tell me about that because yeah. it goes back to the point that for him it was a legal business, but for someone else it's a time 20 years in, in the pan mm. just for selling a wheat, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not supporting any selling heroin or anything like yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. bro, selling selling a weed, like if you're just whatever and you're going to get 20 years for that mm-hmm. and then someone for rape will get like eight or something yeah, or, crazy, or nothing, like yeah, what the crazy. hell, you know? Yeah. So if you will meet someone like that in a, in a pan who has only a charges for a weed, mm. I mean, I would. I think I would be a pretty good friend with him because I'd be like, bro, like you are not even supposed to be here in 2022. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah. You should be immediately released, and mm. you should be like hired by some of those businesses. You know, mm. how common is it there that you will actually find someone there with such a charges for like weed charges? Just for the weed, nothing of else. Course. Just yeah, a weed. yeah, yeah. I would say, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Most definitely, plenty. It's you know, freaking crazy. Yeah, of course. Man. I can't. I cannot. Uh, I can't imagine to mm. live in there and be like. I mean, I really support people who are trying to, like, get those out, mm. you know? I mean, if you don't have any violent crime or something and the only thing is that you sell, like, a couple bags of wheat, like, come on, mm. I can order 30 ounces. They will just yeah, deliver yeah. it to me, like, <laughs> in a sub menu in, like, yeah. 45 minutes. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be right here. Yeah. And I will pay tax on that, 50%. Uh-huh. The government yeah, yeah. is going to get a big chunk of that. Uh-huh. That's crazy. Is there someone who is really, like, sticking out, out of those 12 years, besides your mom, who mm. is... She loves you. Like course, I talk yeah, to her, yeah, yeah. she is aware of your past, but mm. she's glad that you made it alive and mm. then you are who you are. But is there mm. someone besides her who really stick out of the crowd of the people you are meeting mm. who you remember until now or you are friends with until now? Like, mm. is there someone like that? It can be from prison or out of the prison. Yeah, yeah. I would say just because we've been majorly talking about prison and my experience in prison. The person that comes to my mind just immediately is my dog Marcus Cray. Uh, Marcus got a life sentence. Um, I think he shot somebody in the face with a shotgun. Um, crazy crime. He's gang used to be gang affiliated. Uh, crazy street past, you know. Um, but through his life sentence and through his incarceration, you know, Jesus completely transformed his life. And I remember uh, he was in a cell next to me. This is when I was in the two man cell. Whenever I was. In my first prison bid, I was about to go home. I think I had six months left. And I was 20 years old. That's when I first met him. And, uh, you know, we just began to just to chop it up and vibe. And he was on fire for the Lord. But he was real quiet. Um, he, had, he was a barber. He had huge influence on the pound. Everybody knew he was, like, you know, ex-gang affiliated. And uh, a lot of the guys who were still actively banging would go to him for counsel, would go to him for advice. And he was just wise, bro, with the wisdom of God. He would always, like, calm down conflict and, you know, ultimately share the gospel with these men. And uh, I was young, you know, and I was, you know, just young in my relationship with the Lord. And the Lord really used him to mentor me and disciple me spiritually. But the reason why I mention him is because not only did, like, we meet then and we had, like, a strong bond and connection, but every time I come back to prison, I'd always run into him every time. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, like, it was shameful in a sense to where, like, I actually was released from that prison. And when I came back to prison the second time, they sent me straight there. So, remember, I was in a dorm with lifers when I left. So, like, all these boys, you know what I mean? They're happy to see me go. They know I'm going to get out and do right. Or that's my intention. That's my aim. Everyone's rooting for me. And then fail. And then right when they see me come back, I fail. And, like, I remember getting off the bus. I knew I was going back there. I didn't want to go back. I did because, like, I had a lot of homies there. Those were my dogs. And I was, like, excited to see them even (laughs) while I'm in prison. But I was disgraced of myself and Mm shame that I, like, let not only, of course, I let myself down, my kids down, my family. Yeah, but failed. I let that down because they don't yeah. got another chance at life. Mm-hmm. You know, so I remember just seeing them and everybody's like, dang, bro, what <laughs> happened? I remember seeing him 
And I remember when he seen me, he's just like, damn, like damn it hurt fair. him. Like he cried, man. He was dropping tears. Like, How many years uh, already passed since he got busted? Like, is he there for? Is he let's say there for ten years already? He was or? already by past like twelve years, I think. And he has like he has a life sentence. So uh, yeah, he's always seen me come back and forth come to back. prison. So whenever I first was in prison, like I was a jit. Mm -hmm. So like old convicts, they'll call you like, hey, you're jit. You know what I mean? Because you're young. So but that bro, means I just grew, young. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. just like you're a kid, like yeah. jit. So I grew up in prison. So uh -huh. it's crazy that these guys, a lot of these guys, watch me grow up in prison. And now I'm 30 years old, mm -hmm. and now I'm calling other kids jit. And yeah. this is crazy how that's the cycle yes. of incarceration, especially like whenever you're living a life of crime, you keep re-entering back into the system. And prison is a small world, man. Of course, Once you are a, in, you are in. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a gang load of prisons all throughout Florida, but people are always getting transferred. You know what I mean? Like your mm -hmm. reputation follows you, your face follows you. So how come you never went out of the Florida system? Because I wasn't federal. It was a state crime. Oh, got yeah. it, got it, got it. So you only stay in the state of Florida. So, Whenever you're federal, that's when they can like, you know, fly you to other So they states. always make a room for you, no matter what. No of matter course. you are always. You know what they tell you whenever they whenever they they release you? We'll leave the lights on for you. There's always a bump. <laughs> Police will clown they and say always that? say that. Yeah, because they see it. You know what I mean? Because whenever I did a long bit, like you always hear it. But when I did those seven years, eight months on the nine years, when I did that long bit, I seen it myself first handedly. I watch people come back. I seen people get out and come yeah. back three times in prison. You know what I mean? So like you see it's like dang. You know, you see, like, why the police be clowning about it, talking about, I'm going to leave the light on for you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, can you tell, take me briefly through your day? Like, mm -hmm. what is the routine? What time you wake up and what time mm -hmm. you go to sleep? And tell me everything in the between, what you can tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just use Columbia as an example. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. let's use this as well. Yeah, I'll use Columbia as an example. So I'll probably, it all depends, man. If it's the weekend, sometimes I'm staying up because we had a TV, like. In so the, there's uh, a difference between weekend and weekday. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah. Oh, for you. And even and even for, uh, like I said, bro, everyone can structure your own time accordingly. Got it. It all depends where you at, what dorm you in, who's running the dorms. A, a whole new officer can come in a dorm, and your day can change based upon what they're going to permit you to do. You know, so it all, it's, it's, uh, there's multiple variables, but I can give you a generic, like, template. So uh, I'll probably, you know what I mean, wake up. You know, a lot of times I don't go to breakfast. Sometimes I go to breakfast. Breakfast is like 5 in the morning, 5.30. Sometimes I wake up and go. Sometimes I just sleep in. <laughs> so I wake up, you know, maybe around like 6.40, 6.30, 7, get up, brush my teeth, get in the Word, read the Bible, pray, spend time with the Lord. Um, during this time, I was in college, so I may have to go to a <laughs> class, you know what I mean, or um, do my work. Got but it. the majority of my day, bro, um, I was intentional about a few things. Number one, my workout. I work out five to six days a week, you know, so obviously like in a lot of prisons, there's no more weights. So you use like books and bags or sand and yeah. bags or on a rec yard, you know what I mean? Pull up bars, dip bars or working out with people. So I work out with my workout click, you know what I mean? And I'm doing time with these guys in the same dorm for like three years. So everybody's like, you know, got their clicks and their homeboys and their fam. So I'm hanging out with my dogs all day. Uh, working out, doing schoolwork in the Bible, but also two men ministry, bro, and music. You know, I, I spent hours daily in the laundry room. In the laundry room was like my spot because, you know, we always had access to go in and out there. But like, because there was privacy in there. I go in the laundry room and close the door and I'm always writing my music in there. I listen to like my MP3 with instrumentals and I'm writing music, writing music. People are always coming in there and getting their clothes and I listen to my music and just a hangout spot, you know. So I was always intentional daily about perfecting my craft. And that's like how I do my time because I'm a rapper. Now, everybody else is going to be rapping yeah, for hours a day, but that's what I'm doing because I'm a rapper. You know what I mean? So I'm perfecting my craft while I'm incarcerated. Uh, and then also to ministry, bro. You know, we led um, small group. I led small group discipleship every Thursday night. I normally preach on the rec yard weekly, preaching the chapel weekly. So I'm always studying the Bible, preparing sermons. But most importantly, too, just living life with the guys who, like, or my assign it got my God's divine assignments for me to mentor to pour into. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I'm intentionally following up with guys in my dorm, guys on the compound that I know, just living life with them. You know what I mean? Just letting them vent, giving them counsel, just clowning, hanging out, having fun. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, always making sure that I'm sharing the gospel and just trying to help them whatever they're going mm -hmm. through. So that was really like the my my oasis in prison. Because in the midst of my pain, bro, there was purpose. Like, my my incarceration wasn't just dead time, bro. I had purpose in my incarceration. 
So that's what had me look at prison differently. It's not like I'm just laying down doing time away from my family. This sucks. Yeah, it's a part of it. It sucks. I'm away from my kids. I'm missing everything. But also, too, like, yo, God's using me in here. They're banging I have purpose in here. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking in my purpose in here. So for me, like my experience in prison, like is different. I'm not, like there's many people who have that type of experience. Yeah. What I'm saying is, like, even though the prison system and the time and all that sucks, but still in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of all that trauma, in the midst of doing time, yo, there is purpose for me in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. why to this day, bro, I wouldn't take back one day. My greatest shame of my life, besides my unfaithfulness unto the Lord, is abandoning my kids. And not being present for my children in their childhood. That's my biggest shame. But I wouldn't take back one day. Because mm -hmm. God used mm -hmm. every single day, every relationship, every conflict, every fight, every situation, every year in prison to make me who I am today. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't change none of it, bro. Interesting. None of it. Let me ask you about the guards a little bit. Because I interview one of them. And mm -hmm. obviously I cannot ask her a questions. Mm -hmm that only the prisoners would would be good to answer you know yeah, yeah. so um are there some that are good and some that are like maniacs of course man yeah, yeah. Like, like people right yeah. you have those out on the street as well and you got those in that system as well same thing bro Do, is there any chance that you can create some mutual respect between a guard and prisoner or it's always no, like yeah definitely definitely and i guess it depends upon the person bro you know because I don't know what they pay correctional officers entry level, but I'm sure it's not that much. No, it's, uh, nothing. it's very low. It's, it's like nothing. 15 or 14, 16 dollars, whatever. So you got some people who view it just as a job and they're just come in. They're not being friendly. They don't talk to no inmate. They just come in there, keep their head low, do their job and go home. And the average convict, that's, that's who we like the most. Stay out of the way. Don't say nothing to me. Do your job and go home. But then you got other people who can go in there And maybe because they're hurting, they're broken, they really don't have fulfillment or identity or purpose, or maybe they're face they face rejection as a child or they never really fit in. So when they have that little bit of uh, authority and that badge, they come in there and they're like, turn that TV down. And they're oh, trying really? to flex their authority and they're just being petty about every rule, trying to enforce everything. And they're just like dominant tyrants. So you got those type of officers. And then you got other officers, man, who are like, they're just like, they're like, they're just like me. You're just in a brown uniform or whatever uniform you got on. You know what I mean? Like you're hanging out, talking to everybody, vibing, getting to know people, still doing your job, still not compromising, like in your, you know, employment, but you're just being respectful, living life with us. You know what I mean? Talking and all that. So, man, you got multiple, just like, it's just people, it's personalities. It's based mm -hmm. upon the individual, mm -hmm. but there are officers who are cool. There are all officers that are not. There are mm -hmm. officers that are abusive, you know what I mean? And will, you know, physically, you know, like, you know, torture inmates, or if they're in confinement, give them air trays, no food, whatever. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it all depends upon the person. Mm -hmm. They're not armed, right? No, uh, they got, um, Baton. they got mace. Okay. And uh, I think they got tasers now too. Oh, got it. Yeah, I think that was a new thing before I was getting out. Which, uh, which uh, group of officers, what do you think, you know, like which, which group of officers out of those two that you just mentioned, mm. um, is there one of those group that is willing to step up when there is let's say a fight or something that let's say one of those like group of officers are gonna step up and break the fight and some group of officers is gonna be just like watching and not doing anything engaging seeing mm -hmm. the situation escalate but they aren't gonna do anything can you say that certain groups of the officers that you just mentioned are more willing to do such a things than the others yeah of course man really of course yeah yeah there's some officers like i remember whenever i got i got in a fight on the rec yard like whenever like i think it was my second bid and i got hit with the um riot can like point blank range from like the the rec officer so the riot can they call it black jesus because they make you scream for jesus when you get hit with it and the can's black you know so uh they just that's his nickname in prison they hit you hit you with that black jesus so i got hit with that like point blank range and i got doused in it and uh so Thank God, by the favor and mercy of God, the officer, like, after they, like, you know, cuffed me up, I couldn't breathe, you know what I mean? I'm burning up. The officer is literally running me to confinement, so I get in the shower. 
Mm. Like, yo, that's like, that was above and beyond on his part. Mm. You know what I mean? Because mm. he knows like how serious, like I got hit with the riot camp, point blank range. So like he was helping me out by like, like I got you, bro. Come on. Like running me yeah. to confinement. He realized. Well, other officers, you know what I mean? Like based upon the circumstance of the situation or who they are, they don't care, bro. They'll let you suffocate to death while they're walking you. Or they'll purposely go slower or whatever, you know? So yeah, of course you got some officers that, that genuinely care for like someone's well-being. And our other officers don't care out of whatsoever. It's how, just based upon who they are. And to how many fights did you got? Can you even count it? Me? Yeah. Honestly, bro, I barely got any fights whatsoever all throughout my 12 years in prison. Oh, nice. Yeah, man. Interesting. Uh, and number one, I credit that just to God's favor. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, just because, remember, my prison experience was different than somebody who was like, actively gang affiliated yeah, sure, or sure. living a street lifestyle in prison mm -hmm. i'm not running around with a knife like stabbing people or mm -hmm. trying to rob people or gang banging or mm -hmm. anything like that i'm pursuing jesus and god's it, transforming my life and i'm ministering the gospel you know so yeah. don't get me wrong like even still while doing that and god transforming my life there were situations to where i could be disrespected Or I feel some type of way about something to where like but that's where i learned to be assertive mm -hmm. and i learned to be like Like not be pussy. Yeah. Yeah. I, never, I ain't never been pussy, but I learned to be like, all right, you, like, hey, let me holler at you, bro. Like I can do it like, assertively but respectively. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let me holler at you. You learn how to solve the situations like some other way. Yeah. That's and I, I think people say. respect that, bro. Mm -hmm. You know. And I think like whenever you speak to any man, no matter where they're from yeah. or where their mind's at, don't get me wrong. Some people they reach a point to where they're gone, yeah, just... and maybe it's got to let them cool off, and you can revisit it later. But for the most part, bro, <laughs> like any rational man. Like, you can discuss, like, yo, bro, like, don't disrespect me like mm -hmm. that, bro. I wouldn't try you like that. You know, whatever. But also, too, I think it's just because God's always naturally placed on my life influence. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a leader. Mm -hmm. So I think because of that, normally at any prison I've gone to, like, the big gang leaders and people with the most influence, those are normally my homeboys. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm always cool with them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I remember, like, going to certain prisons, like a JIT camp. And when everyone's walking into the dorm at first, like everyone's has to tighten up. Everyone's got to line it up. They're like, yo, tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. It means you got to go grid. You got to go fight. And I remember that happened to like the whole squad walking in the dorm. They didn't do it to me. Damn. And it wasn't because I'm some freaking Billy bad guy, tyrant, crazy guy. It's just because it so happened that the head blood in the dorm is my dog. And he seen me before I even walked in. Mm. So he approached like whoever was like calling everybody. I said him in the back, like, no, nah, that's my mm -hmm. dog. You know what I mean? So it was different. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think ultimately I credit all that to just the favor of God. Mm -hmm. But also too, I think it's just because I've always been like outgoing, social, I get along yeah. with everybody. Good. But there has been times where I had to grit. You know what I mean? To where like I was disrespected and there was whether whether it be I was just impulsive and I didn't feel like talking about it and I wanted to fight, or whether it was a situation where I had to defend myself. Mm -hmm. But um, few far in between, man. That, that barely ever happened. I thank God for How that. How many tattoos did you get in this? Oh, this all of period? them, bro. I'm completely wet, bro. From prison? All of this is prison work. Those are actually pretty good, man. Yeah, man. Shout like... out to my tattoo, man. He actually... Uh, <laughs> Listen, you know it's crazy. Well, I'm I'm entirely wet. All of my legs, my thighs oh, up really? here, yeah. behind my armpits, my whole back, everything. So you know what's funny too is the tattoo man, like the guy who did the majority of my work, uh, and he was at that prison with me. Uh, man, listen, you know who he comes to our Bible study every Thursday. He's out now. He's living in Tampa where I'm living at, and he's part of the ministry, bro. Nice. So he's doing good. He's doing awesome. Is he doing the tattoo job on the... In the streets now, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but he's probably using better equipment, yeah, right? Yeah, but now he's using street ink and street guns. Damn. But this is crazy how that comes full circle. Yeah, sure. Because I just remember the times when we would be in the laundry room, dog, dog, people watching for the police while he's running on my back or anywhere else doing tattoo work, or I'm on the bunk upside down and he's doing my entire neck. But now we're on the street. And he's we're just like running. He's running tattoos on me in the house. And uh, it's just funny how all that yeah, came yeah, full yeah, circle. Yeah. Yes, you know what I mean. So it's illegal to get the tattoos in there, as you said that you have to pay pay attention if the guards see yeah, you or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. But like obviously, once it's done, it's it's visible, right? So yeah, yeah. 
you came there fresh and now you're all covered. Uh-huh. So, I mean, you do, they see that you did that. You're not going to get, yeah, yeah. You, are you going to get punishment for getting I mean, tattoos? Yeah, you can. It depends who it is. They can be petty, bro. And once again, that's another variable. It depends upon who it is. Yes, depends on the and person. And where you're at. Mm-hmm. Man, it's so prevalent in the chain game, mm-hmm. bro. They ain't stunned. They ain't stunned no tattoos. They mm-hmm. worried about getting stabbed or yeah, drugs. Yeah, yeah. Or it's whatever. like a minor activity. Yeah, but if they want to be petty, they can be petty. And they say, oh, that's new tattoo. And you get a DR and go to confinement or whatever. How does it work with visits and stuff like that? Like, mm. let's say if let's say your mom mom would would like to see you. Let's say mm. you are there three years. She want to see you. How mm. often she can actually see you? Uh, they can see you. I, I think that changes too. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, man, I think they can base it upon like the last number of your DC number, and like you could only get visits like every other weekend or something. But normally. It you can get weekend, you can get a visit every Saturday and Sunday and holiday. That's normally how it is. But sometimes they'll change it just because of like the influx of visitors or the, mm-hmm. the prison institution or just like whoever's running, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, the Department of Corrections or whatever. And plus, if you would do some something in in uh, in there, you would stab someone and you are in the hole or something. Then oh, you, of course, yeah, then you personally, you yeah. If you're in confinement, yeah, you can't get visits or you can even get your visits your visitation revoked. Based upon like if you oh, fail a piss test or behavior and stuff like yeah, that. or if you get a, a piss certain, test, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, they are actively test. drug testing uh, you, of course, yeah, all the time, yeah, but, randomly. But uh, yeah, they do drug tests like every night, every night. Yeah, but people are using drugs normally, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I've been told that you can get anything in prison. Mm-hmm. What you can get on the street, you can get in prison. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, whatever drug you can think of, it's in society, it's in prison. Yeah, it's crazy. As well as with phones. And phones. Yeah. I saw some Facebook streams from there. I'm like, what an idiot. They're just mm-hmm. streaming online on Facebook and they're like acting like big shots. Mm-hmm. And what do you think is gonna happen to you? Like, I mean, you are creating evidence against yourself. <laughs> like, I mean, if you're a lifer, like probably it doesn't matter, right? Care, yeah. But I was like always wondering, like, it's pretty good quality. Like, did they just get iPhone in there? Like, uh-huh. oh my God, that's just crazy. You can see that uh, you cannot stop the, uh-huh. the technology coming I actually coming went out. viral before I got out. Really? from social media yeah i got 1.2 million views on one of my tiktok videos really yeah i was i wasn't like in prison prison but i was at work at least before i got out and uh that's actually i think that was the favor of god the guy preparing my platform yes with music yes. before i got out because uh yeah i was getting like it like i, like I said 1.2 million views from that's like a, a video in like the cell And it didn't get you in trouble? Man, I was terrified. I was looking at the comments every day. And it's like people are even calling out where it is. So I'm like deleting those comments. <laughs> I was about to delete it because I only had like months to go. I was about to delete it, bro. Uh, but I didn't. What do you think if they would find out? What do you think it would get you? They could like send you back to prison. For maybe. how long? You probably would have like, I probably wouldn't have lost no gang time or nothing, but I probably just would have had to do the rest of my time in prison rather than at work at least. Oh, God. Yeah, because at, like, at work at least, they really don't, because you're allowed to have phones at work at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just can't be like on social media and yes, stuff. Yes, got it. I mean? so. so the work release was after how many years? Uh, work at least, like in the state of Florida, like after you have 19 months or less. Got it. Is when you reach that criteria. Mm-hmm. And what work release is, is like you're still incarcerated. You're still doing your prison sentence. But they transform you from a prison facility to like it'll normally be like a, a old hotel that they'll renovate and it'll be like multiple people in a room. And what you can do is you leave and you go to work. Mm-hmm. So like you'll catch the city bus to work and you'll work a real job and you'll get real money. But you just have to come back at a certain time. They know your schedule. You can only go to work and back. You got an ankle monitor. I was just on. about to ask. Her. Yeah. So they can track you and everything. Uh, but really, like that's the best thing yes. in the prison system. When it comes to transition, mm-hmm. because you can save money, man. By the favor of God, I came home with bands. I mean, I came home like strapped, and I was nothing because of God's favor, but because I was at work at least for like 14 months, and I got a job immediately at fifteen dollars an hour, That's... and I'm working like 65, 62 hours a week, all that overtime, and then I got a raise to like sixteen fifty to where when I left, I was getting paid eighteen fifty. So mm-hmm. I came home with a lot of money. And that really, and that's what I mean by that's the best thing about like transitioning mm-hmm. is in the prison system is because you have the opportunity mm-hmm. to come home with money. Because a lot of guys in the prison system, they're in prison because they don't have support. They don't have family. So to come home with money yeah. is a world of difference. I think that is the, that is the key thing. Because mm-hmm. if you come home and you're broke, you don't know anyone, you have nowhere to go yeah. and they will tell you, do good. Mm-hmm. 
How the hell do you want to do good? The people will like, instinctively in survival mode yeah. normally revert right back to what is survival and that's yeah. selling drugs or robbing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. Right yeah. in point because it's all about survival. Life is only about survival. And mm. you do whatever it takes to do so. And once you are stripped of your all the opportunities, and it can be completely 100% your fault. I'm not saying mm. that it's, it's not, you know, but you have to be realistic. Yeah. You are letting those guys on the street and... You are not providing anything. Mm. In LA, it happened to me that I got in uh, Santa Monica. I got from the train, and there was a guy, and he was having the suit from the Twin Tower jail. It's the orange one. He had mm. still the pants on, and he was just dropped off there because what they does, what they do is they they drop them in downtown. They tell them, okay, you are released, whatever. Mm. He gets out, and now go now what? Mm. He's just gonna jump on a train, go to Santa Monica where tourists are, and beg for money. Yeah, and you're like. Is it for real? Yeah. He just got out like mm. this morning. Mm. And like that's what he does. And you yeah. are thinking he's gonna do be good. Successful. Yeah, he's yeah. gonna be successful. Yeah. I don't know this guy, I don't know what, what he did or did not. Mm. I don't care really, to be honest. Mm. But I see it, I'm like, that's not right. That's not the system how it should work. So I'm actually glad that there is some transition. Mm. And speaking of those transitions and stuff like that, I wanna ask you about the graduation because you just said like that you you were like, you know. You did college, and meanwhile you were doing time and so on, and and that is it. That is like when you actually can graduate, and mm -hmm. that is it. So you, yeah. if we would be like really looking and looking, we could maybe find your picture being like yeah, right there. Yeah. Damn. And how does like, how does let's say the society accept uh, accept you when you have such a like such a degree or like from such an institution? Like, mm. does it make a difference? Or they will say, oh, he he got his degree when he was in, in prison. Well, like, the thing is, no one knows, because that's like a real college. That's like oh, a prison. That's not God. like, that's not like prison college. That's like, you know, an accredited college from the streets. That's specifically Florida Gateway College in Lake City, Florida. And, you know, they're part of like the Pell Grant, the Second Chance Pell Grant oh, program. So no one knows that. pretty much. So, yeah, whenever I get out and whenever I go apply for a job or if I want like, show like you know my you know just resume or whatever i'm showing you know a real associate's degree from florida gateway college interesting yeah and so they don't know i got it in prison but i can communicate that in my narrative if i choose to you know i don't think something like that is taking place in california mm -hmm. because none of those guys mentioned that they said that they are released from prison mm -hmm. and they go right to their life mm -hmm. And some of them said, especially the last one that I interviewed, he said that if he wouldn't have his dad, mm. where he like took him back after all these failures, whatever, he's like, I just told him like last time and mm. he did that. And I said, I cannot fail him. And I and he didn't fail him since. Mm. It must be so hard to go in there. But I mean, if you have such opportunities mm. that you can go to school mm. or work between your release date and uh, your you know, prison time and you mm. can, you can, you can kind of work out. Mm. That's, that's pretty. But this joke. is what I want to say though about that. Okay. That experience, my experience is the anomaly because listen, this right here isn't a, this is a government experiment. So this isn't going on throughout the entire state of Florida. Well, of course. So like I was the first class and there's only 65 of us oh. and there was a following class after that. Yeah. But it's not it's like, just... it's not like consistently. So, like, they only chose 16 states and a select amount of people. And even yeah. people who are eligible. 36 men yeah. graduated. And even the people who are eligible to go to work release. If I was to throw out numbers and guess, I would say maybe 1% out of the incarcerated population in Florida will ever experience that. Unless they make it a permanent thing, which hopefully they do. But I would yeah. say right now, that's right. like 1%. And then I would even say work release is probably maybe... 10 percent 25 percent so it's very it's very it's, it's rare that people go to prison and have the opportunity to go to work at least or to get like a college degree but i mean there is a hope right i mean you see this going on so why it wouldn't so, be so yeah, yeah it is it is it is steps in the right direction but the call to action would be when it comes to prison reform but look at that it says like misery it says another inside virginia first prison mm -hmm. fell you also, uh, see, so probably pretty much Wisconsin. So you probably see that this is some experience that is taking place maybe nationwide. Exactly. But it's very small. And I'm really glad to see that. Yeah. Because if you don't, if people don't have a purpose and mm. if they don't have a joy, mm. they're not going to do any good. Yeah. If you don't have any purpose in life. So you show them just, you know, like probably for most of the people, and I'm just assuming, but 36 men graduated. How many you think 
would actually meet people like that that are surrounding them, studying with them in real mm-hmm. life. Probably none of them. They or they only knew like a crime life and whatever. And mm-hmm. now they go to school and they are seeing same people with same kind of like mm-hmm. intentions of doing good. So I don't think why this would be bad, you exactly. know, for like the system. And how much does it cost compared to how much the whole thing costs? It, mm-hmm. It's probably just pennies, yeah. you know. That's and, another thing I want to ask you. Yeah. So this lastly on that, from my perspective, from coming from the system, like if I could ever have any opinion or voice to the system of what needs to be changed, they have all these bootleg, stupid, dumb programs in the system that are just skeletons of appearance. They do nothing for the inmate population. Does not help whatsoever. The people behind the scenes now can help people. But the programs and the templates, majority of them don't do no help whatsoever. But opportunities like that, if that was to be statewide, you know, nationwide, to give men who are incarcerated or women the opportunity to get their college degree, man, that's life changing, bro. Because sadly, a lot of us, and especially myself, when I first started, bro, I barely knew my multiplication tables, bro. I didn't think I could do it, but I was committed and I did it. So not only did it like I increase you know, and grow in knowledge and become like a critical thinker, but it also boosts like my confidence and my mm-hmm. self-esteem. And I think I was already like emotionally and mentally healthy because of the transformation of Jesus in my life. But I can only imagine how much you can do for other men who yeah. are like struggling even worse emotionally and psychologically, mm-hmm. how much that can be life-changing for them. Mm-hmm. And I know firsthand a lot of guys I was in prison with who are working for the county now as wastewater operators because of that specific program. That is interesting. That's yeah. nice. So that needs to be done at a mass scale. Mm-hmm. Well, but that is in conflict in what the prison system in US is because mm. prison system in United States, it's money making system. Business. It's a business. Mm. So why would you make it better? Yeah. It's a business. The goal for this business is not ended up and have a good healthy society the mm-hmm. business of this is make to money keep, to keep men incarcerated keep, keep people in incarcerated, yeah. yeah there's no there's no intention i'm that's why i'm really surprised that actually there is something like that because normally mm-hmm. I, it's something i never actually encounter mm-hmm. i mean i saw now and then the programs you are talking about that you can go and work in the library and stuff like that but mm-hmm. it's not that's not life changing thing yeah but because the goal is to keep you in Once you are in, you are in, you are making us money. Mm-hmm. Most of the prisons are not even state owned. They are like, you know, they are mm-hmm. <laughs> private companies just yeah. like, and get, they are getting paid by the government, like yeah. thick checks. So why yeah. would they stop it and be like, oh, we don't have any more inmates. Okay, we are just gonna close it. Mm-hmm. Well, of course not. Um, I have a couple more questions like related to that. And then yeah. we can talk more about the the present if you want or whatever, whatever you want to talk, you know. Yeah. But uh, how real is the is the soap in the in the shower thing <laughs> you talking about rape prison rape yes. how real is it um i wouldn't say that like i would say the soap in the shower i would just say that's uh <laughs> that's just like a uh, movie that's just like a a meme that's just like a yes, joke yes. you know what i mean like uh-huh. yeah that's not real you know that's like a prison th- <laughs> that's like a movie prison thing uh but is there like rape and sexual assault in prison of course yeah definitely but as far as like everyone going to like an open shower together and if someone drops the soap like immediately like people are gonna rush you and gang rape you like no that's not <laughs> that's not going down you know so uh, i had to ask the same question because i i uh, asked the same to the guard uh, and she told me that the same answer pretty much like you did but she uh, told me that she one time like uh went into shower and she saw two guys like in it mm. and she was like i just have to be like okay i'm of going course out. homosexuality is rampant yeah, yeah because she said it's like a one thing that she always have in front of their eyes and that's a scene she will never forget mm. <laughs> she's like i never want to see this again <laughs> yeah so i mean like a sexual assault happens yeah uh homosexuality is definitely rampant that's definitely a thing but i would say when it comes to the sexual assault part what's most common is like you like what we call them like it's booty bandits you got like these old convicts You know what I mean? I mean? Maybe they ain't even the convict. Maybe they just like are short timers. They could, or maybe they have life. Sen- doesn't matter. Whatever. They're just gay. All right. Mm-hmm. They're 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 living a homosexual lifestyle, mm-hmm. but like an aggressive, you know, uh, assaulting, yeah. like a predatorial one. Mm-hmm. So what you see is like we call them the booty bandits. What they'll do is they'll take advantage of like young men or you know people who are scared or like are new to the environment so it's common yeah pray like it's common like the stereotypical situation is like a young white boy coming to prison 
who's scared. You know what I mean? Who may have like some weird charge mm-hmm. of like a sex crime oh, okay. against a child or just maybe some like nerd, like video gamer who did something that's really weird and random and got some time behind it. Yeah, but steal some movie and yeah, put it online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's not he's not fitting in this atmosphere. Got it. He's terrified and you can tell. So then you'll see like in the dorm, this old convict always pulling up on him. You know what I mean? Giving him food or giving him cigarettes or giving him drugs or trying to befriend him. That boy trying to get his booty, man. You know what I mean? They're trying to finesse him. You know, he's playing up under it, getting close to him, you know? So that's 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 the common sexual assault thing that you see in the chain mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. It's those old convicts. You know what I mean? I wouldn't say old, but any person who's like the homosexual predatorial person, you know, like with the finesse, with like the those type of people who are like mm-hmm. out of place and scared. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes you hear like stories of like, you know, rape. Normally, but that's like behind the door, like in confinement. Or like CM, which is like twenty three hour, twenty four hour lockdown, twenty three hour lockdown for like years at a time. Mm-hmm. So your stories like that, they're not super common. Does it happen? Yeah, mm-hmm. Does you it know. Happen? I mean, so. pretty much in this environment, anything can really of happen. Course, you bro. know, because my, my I ask that not because I'm looking for some sensation, but I'm trying mm-hmm. to imagine a situation that you are young, you mm-hmm. are just around men, mm-hmm. and you are all filled with testosterone aggression it has to go somewhere mm-hmm. it's something that you cannot really measure you cannot mm-hmm. wait it but it's there you know you know how it is to be a guy when you go you hit the gym mm-hmm. or you go fight you know mm-hmm. or like when we are wrestling you mm-hmm. you are fighting against a man mm-hmm. and that's the energy you are giving out mm-hmm. but now it's very control environment you only have those savage guys around you there's no mm-hmm. women which is very mm-hmm. unnatural for a man to be just surrounded by guys mm-hmm. in society that doesn't really exist you know mm-hmm. you will never be just around men 24 7 mm-hmm. you know um so that's why i ask for that you know mm-hmm. when is when does this all go to mm-hmm. uh how would those guys same guys who are like You know, savages, they are like young, full of testosterone. Mm-hmm. How would they react if they see a female guard? It's the only yeah, female yeah. they see. Yeah, that's prevalent, man. Um, in the chain gang, obviously, like the average majority of the men incarcerated, uh, how like that's outlitted. You know what I mean? The sexual like frustration not being able to have sex, whatever is pornography, you know, uh, or just, you know, fantasizing, you know, masturbation, whatever, um, like, you know, in your privacy. Uh, but yeah, especially that as well. And of course, too, like, you know, women that you know from the streets, like on the phone, letters, visitation, girlfriends. But yeah, prison officers, as far as the women, females, of course. You know, some 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 guys, man, that's how they do their time. Is uh, that, that all they're doing is just shooting their shots at the women officers and, uh, you know, just pursuing them and, you know, just, you know, flirting or trying to have sex with them. What if the, what if the guard is like kind of accepting it? Of course, that's prevalent in, in prison system as well. So they're accepting it from the convicts. I mean, I wouldn't say like it's it's the same type of thing with any you know uh, any question about you know prison or prisoner or oh, officer. Depends, yeah. It all depends upon the personality mm-hmm. and the person. Have you experienced like did you know some guys who were hitting on some? Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> that's yeah. be kind of weird, right? Yeah. You don't. That was a challenge for me as far as even being a young follower of Jesus in prison. The temptation. And the pursuit of relationship with staff, with women staff. Uh-huh. Yeah. So even myself personally, I experienced that. I won't go into the fullness of the details, but I mean, just like in society, when there's men and women around each other, there's attraction uh-huh. and, you know, there's opportunity. So same thing with incarceration. You know, you have women who are working in facilities, whether they be officers or whether they just be staff from food service or whatever. You know, so there's always... How know. about if some guard is, like, um, playing with you? So, meaning she's wearing a makeup, mm. but she is not going to give you anything. She is harsh on you. She's hard, but she's wearing a makeup. She's mm. obviously showing you that she is a woman. Mm. But she does that for the reason that she wants to feel in power. Mm. That you are looking at her. Like, yeah. how do you deal with We call them uh, chain gang divas. Oh, you guys yeah. have nicknames for Chang, everything. Yeah, yeah, Chang Gang Divas, yeah. And that's one thing, too, is funny in prison. Like, every officer gets a nickname. You know what I mean? So, like, <laughs> like people don't even call them by their names, like, on the pound. Like, every officer got, like, some funny nickname. But anyways, like, that's a type of 
person that you would call like a chain gang diva. Mm-hmm. You know, women who you're not busting shots at them. You know, because they're just healing. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for fil- for, for, for for fulfillment, and that's through the attention of other men. Mm-hmm. So of course you got women like in society who may not be the most beautiful outwardly or attractive. But when they enter into a prison atmosphere with men who are incarcerated, they're getting a whole bunch of attention just because they're women, you know, so that can cause them certain women to be very um, uh, just longing for more attention. And it can Mm -hmm. cause them to be more Mm -hmm. flirtatious Mm -hmm. or it can cause them to kind of get like proud and arrogant and big headed. And they think that they're like Beyonce. That's divorce, man. That's divorce because she's there in power and you you're you all are just like looking at her like damn and she knows she can play with you Mm -hmm. and those games can be dangerous as Mm -hmm. well because you do one stupid thing and that can add up on 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 your record as well Mm -hmm. Uh, i have to say interesting interesting experience was there let's say in those 12 years and the time um a moment when you would just completely break down like straight up just cry be like what did i do what Mm -hmm. did i what did i what did i (laughs) participate with was there some certain moment when you really had no feeling no home feeling Mm. nowhere to go no one to call like yeah of course man i can think of like i think three separate occasions maybe like maybe three or four that stick out the most just whenever you said that number one is like i remember being 18 years old and my first day in prison i got in a fight in the open bay dorm within the first 45 minutes beat up a guy, tried to hit me with a lock. You know what I mean? So we're fighting, you know, in the dorm. Anyways, I'm in confinement, like, my first day. And I remember being in confinement. And they had put me in a cell at my, by myself at first just because, like, the confinement other rooms were full. And I remember just looking in the mirror. 18 years old, my baby mom was pregnant. And I remember the lights were obviously late night. And I remember just looking in the mirror, just looking at myself. And, like, I was just, like, actually, like, analyzing and processing like, what am I doing with my life? You know what I mean? Like, everyone my age is, like, graduating this year and, like, getting their, like, diplomas in high school. And I'm in prison. Like, in confinement. Just, like, like got hit with a lock. <laughs> or, like, almost hit with a lock. My kids, <laughs> like, my, my baby mom was pregnant. You know, I'm about to Did be Did they put father. it into the sock or something and yeah, smash yeah, yeah, it? Yeah. Did what, they? What you know about the lock in the sock, man? Well, it's a weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I talk to guys who, who do that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. So it was definitely a lock in the sock. Lock yeah, in yeah. the sock? Lock in the sock, yeah. Because I'm imagine they don't have a lock for the, for the bi- bike or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was this. Lock in the sock. Yeah, but the lock in the sock and it becomes like a weapon. Interesting. So um, so that was a moment, you know, it's where it was, wasn't so much like an outward breakdown. Mm-hmm. But it was like a inner realization and a realization of like, what am I doing? So that, um, I think the first time I seen my kids was another one. My kids were um, one years old. Both of them are twins, a boy and a girl, Steven and Jazaria. Damn, you were lucky, man. Yeah, so yeah, I was blessed, praise God. Uh, so I was like maybe 19 years old. And I held my kids for the first time when they were one in visitation. And I remember just holding them crying. And just realizing I was missing everything. You know what I mean? So that hit me. I would say another time. Um, what's another time, bro? Whenever I caught this this last sentence, when I got sentenced to nine years, I was contemplating suicide. I was in confinement. Um, I was I was fighting in the county jail. I just, because I was upset, man. Like, all the time I got... Um, I, you know, got in a fight in my dorm. I had a broken leg from my accident. I got a real bad car accident. My femur snapped through my thigh. So I just was like rewalking and I was going to physical therapy. Long story short, you know, I'm, I'm so furious inside and broken with all this time. I just got missing everything in my kid's childhood. I know it's about to happen. Mm-hmm. The dude in front of me bucks me on the phone, tries to double back. I just needed a reason. I'm mm-hmm. going through all this pain, all this chaos. I just needed a reason. He was my reason. And I just snapped. Mm-hmm. You know, we got in a fight. Long story short, I go to confinement. And I remember it's when I did just got sentenced. Or, like, I think maybe it was, like, that next following week I got sentenced. And I remember I didn't eat for days. And I couldn't even, like, get out of my bunk. It, like, hit me. And uh, I remember just, like, staring at the sprinkler on the wall. And just, you know, like, you like I, I've done enough time. I know how people hang themselves, you know. And I know the people who have attempted to and the people who have, you know, killed themselves. So I remember just looking at a sprinkler and just laying at it, looking at it for hours. 
and just contemplating and just visualizing me hanging myself and just like ending it all. You know, like why do I continue to do this to myself and my family? And, you know, praise God, like I didn't, you know what I mean, like even attempt to. But it was just those thoughts. I wasn't suicidal ever. You know what I mean? But it was just those thoughts that yeah. were like, that was like real. The situation got yeah, you to that yeah. position when you were like, fuck. Yeah. And then lastly, I would say another time emotional was actually coming home. Um, mm. I was surprised how emotional I was coming home. And I'm not, I don't mean coming home as like the day of my release, but like two years left. You know, like three years left, like, like doing, a, left. doing a, like a nine year bid, doing seven years, eight months. Like you're almost home, bro. So like so for somebody else, it's like two, three years. Like that's still a lot of time. But no, bro, that's like I'm almost home. Someone else is viewing it like that's time left. That's no. how I view it. Yeah, yeah. no, not from my, not from my perspective. Like I'm almost home. I'm thinking about release every day. I'm thinking about my future. I'm thinking about my kids. So for like there was a time window and I, I remember specifically uh, I think maybe I had like a year and a half left. It was right before I went to work at least. It was right when COVID hit and before COVID hit in prison. And I remember, man, I was just so, uh, I was just questioning everything. I think I was just really uh, subconsciously, I was scared about getting out. I was really fearful of my success. Uh, and I was just really low. I was super depressed. Uh, and I was just scared, bro, about coming home and the expectation and the standard that I set for myself and everything that was like, was awaiting me, the transition and like me re-entering society and being a father to my kids. And man, like, am I really gonna, is this like, am I really going to like stay out and mm -hmm. do good? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, so like just that inward, you know, uh, doubt and uncertainty, yes, yeah. like, man, like I was so surprised. I was depressed for months and um, it was because of other situations. Because you didn't want to fail. Yeah, it was other situations too. I was engaged. I was about to marry a girl coming home, um, but she cheated on me, got pregnant and ghosted me. So that's another story. That was during the same time. And then also too, I was in a spiritual crisis. I began to question like God and the, the existence of God and the Bible and my relationship with Jesus. Cause like my whole life was rebuilt upon yeah. Jesus and Christianity. You know, so like they say, every preacher comes to a crisis in faith to where like they really have to question like is this real you know so all of that was compiling at once plus two my oldest son was going to prison for the first time what well, was the only time he was going yeah he's 20 years old but well, 19 years old and he was going to prison man and i left the streets when he was uh 13 14 and now he's going to prison for a life of crime so I feel the weight of that guilt on my shoulders, the the weight of my release, and if I'm gonna fail, and the expectation of me and my kids, and the woman who I think my is my wife, I'm structuring my release plan around her. She cheats on me and ghosts me, and you know breaks up with me. My first heartbreak ever in my life, and then the spiritual crises, all these things going on at once, mm -hmm. and I'm just at my lowest low. Mm -hmm. And um and I'm about to go home. Mm -hmm. You know, I still had like maybe like a year and a half left. I should be rejoicing and excited. Mm -hmm. But I remember I was just really low. And uh that was a rough point too. You told me that you are out for a little over a year. Uh, no, not even now? Yeah, no. No, no. Not even oh, okay. Nine months. Nine months. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So how did it change in the prison when the COVID COVID hit it? So about oh in prison? Yes. How was it in, in prison with COVID? Mm -hmm. Oh, COVID was crazy, man. Um, you know, because in prison, you watch the news, you read the newspaper, you got magazines, you got TV shows, you can touch out on the phone, but you're still not in culture. You're in prison culture. So hearing all this stuff going on with COVID at first initially was kind of like, all right, you know what I mean? Like, this is kind of weird, you know what I mean? Like, but we really don't know what to expect. You're seeing the deaths like in New York and all that. But then when the police started coming in the dorm with hazmat suits on. What? Yeah, police were coming in the dorm with hazmat suits on. You're like, everyone's like, dang. Like, this is serious. You know, they didn't keep them on the whole time. But like, at first, like, that was our protocol. So when they're coming in the dorm with hazmat suits, we're like, all right, this is kind of scary. This is like a little weird. You guys like little yeah, like Yeah, just... but not only that too. <laughs> bro, they completely locked down the entire prison population. Because bro, like how do you do time? You do time by getting out of the dorm. You go to the rec yard, you go to chapel, you go to the library, you go to the chow hall, you go to other dorms, if you slide, you know, you go hang out with your homeboys. But now because of COVID, 
locked down. No rag, nothing. We're stuck in the dorm for months. Real lockdown. Bro, hard time. Hardest time I ever did. So just think of all the animosity and tension in the dorm. It's chaotic. There's violence popping off everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's chaotic. And people are getting sick on top of that. So they're like trying to pull out the people who are sick and bring them to another dorm and quarantine them. My bunkie died. My bunkie died from COVID, bro. And I was, that was scary. He's an old man who had a uh, health problem. He had like a stroke. So he already had health issues, mm-hmm. and he started uh, urinating on himself, like in the day room and stuff. And eventually, you know, like everyone was trying to take care of him, look out for him, but they took him out of the dorm for quarantine. And we find out like four or five days later that he died. And that's when it's kind of real too. Like, dang, like bro, like he slept next to me. I literally could reach out my arm and hit his hand. Hey, hand me that book right there. You know what I mean? Like he slept right next to me, and he just died. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that was kind of freaking crazy. It you it know? it's also a time when kind of the prison system or the rules all sudden changed mm. and they've been in place for decades mm. and now all sudden something like this comes and completely changed the way how the prison system or how the prison itself works yeah. like how you do you, time how you do time or whatever yeah. so it's brand new you guys don't have any uh, option or, or, mm. or anything and you are just there and you don't know how long it's gonna do you don't know what it is mm. so Did you have to like wear masks there and stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. that? They or were, they were so petty with the masks. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, like no one listened. I ain't listen. I never wore it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like walking back and forth to the chow hall, like you had to have yeah. it on and things yeah. like that. So yeah, they definitely enforced the mask for a long time. Really? Yeah. So that sucked. That's kind of weird that they are enforcing masks, but people are having shanks in their in, yeah, no, right? <laughs> in their hideouts. You know? And it's also too because you got to think, man. Like of course, COVID. Like if one person's sick in the dorm, everyone's getting sick. That's mm-hmm. just how it goes. How this person could get. Sick? Sick. Your, again. how this person could get sick it's prison so supposed to nothing is supposed to go in yeah but i mean you gotta think about who's just coming guards, to supervise just, just guards right? officers mm. who's coming to visit you on the weekends family got it you know what i mean got so it. you got germs and sicknesses yeah. coming from everywhere so Food it's not service workers yeah prison no is not what kind of we feels that it's just super locked isolated nothing goes in nothing so goes nah, out nah, i mean nah. it's an ecosystem that has exactly. its own limits right exactly Exactly. Would you say that this was at least, let's say, interesting time of the of of your sentence? For example, like um, you spent 12 years, and mm. the last part was the COVID part, mm. right? Mm. Do you think like that this was at least interesting, or it was just like straight that up was waste worst of time. time, worst time, right? I think honestly, I could probably say, but I wouldn't blame it on COVID. No, I would say it had to do a part of it. I would say what COVID did that made it part of the worst was the fact that we were isolated. But you got to remember personally what's going on with me. What's going on with me is I'm about to go home. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting to sign up for mm-hmm. work release. I just signed up for work release. All this inward anticipation and fear about release. My ex fiance just got pregnant and ghosted me and broke up with me. You know what I mean? I'm having a spiritual crisis. All of that is on my, my son's going to prison. All of that's weighing on my shoulders. Plus, I can't outlet it because we're confined to a dorm for months and they're not even doing transfers for work release so i'm sweating every week to get off lockdown so i can get transferred and i'm just waiting to go home it's like holding a pit bull who's been starving for weeks and you got a steak in front of his face and he's just raging ready to go that's me but also hurting inside yes so that's why it was like the worst time for me you know what kind of books can you read up there everything you can read everything i would say the only books that you're not allowed to read would be like um stuff that has to do with like gangs or stuff that has to do with um mixed martial arts. Oh really? Um yeah. But you know what's cool too you'd be interested in there's actually like that's a big thing in prison is training. I actually learned Brazilian Jiu Jitsu while I was incarcerated. Interesting. Um I'm not saying like I'm some like savage beast, but that's normally like You know, everyone in prison they have like their cliques and people that hang out with and they like we said, like everyone yeah. could do time differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's people who are incarcerated and a lot of them I know who have life sentences. That's how they do their time. All they do all day, every day is mm-hmm. train. Mm. You know, they train so mixed you can, martial arts. So you can tra- if it's not a fight, but it's a training. You're not like allowed spa- to. No. You also, you cannot train. All like of this is like illegal. Yeah, all of this is like out oh, of the police okay. site. Some police will be cool. That like they'll know you're doing it. You let them know, like, yo, we're back here training. You got to keep it out of the way of the cameras. Do it in the cells. Got it. Got it. You know, it, but sometimes you know, like it can become like a cool little movement, and people know about it. So like they'll like schedule a fight. 
You know what I mean? So, like, everyone will try to go over here and, like, watch a fight. Sometimes even the police hear about it, they'll know about it, and they'll come and watch. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, it'll all be for, like, the the training group, you know what I mean, that's sparring and Mm -hmm. fighting together. Mm -hmm. How much the the money has uh, a value in there? Like, how much is one dollar worth up there? Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's hard to gauge it like when it comes to um Okay, like, so let's say something it. something that we can imagine. How much uh let's say um a gram of wheat would would be costing? I'm not gonna talk about stuff like okay. that. Okay. Yeah, I don't wanna uh, <laughs> And how about a biscuit or something like food? Like how much cost a food like in the cantina or something? Yeah, like, um I would just cafeteria say, or something. I would I would say generally just when it comes to um like because I know you're curious about like drugs prices. and the crime and the crime yeah. stuff like that. No, not really like prices because I had to handle it on something. And I don't know. I think like drugs has the highest value in there. Yeah, yeah. Probably. So I was like looking through it, but you can compare it to something from cafeteria mm. or yeah, s- yeah. whatever. I would okay. I would use something just from from the chow hall. All right. Yeah. Um, they call it the bird tray. You know, a chicken tray. You know, like normally there's chicken like once a week. You know, what I mean chicken on the bone. So normally like you know a, a bird will go for like two dollars or a dollar. It depends. Maybe like a dollar. So just that's drumstick. Like, Yeah, it's like a you know the wing and the oh, drumstick. Okay. It comes yeah. like on a whole little bird. Two dollars. So like you get somebody a honey bun or two soups for a bird. You know what I mean? That's pretty fair price. Two dollars yeah, for yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go go to KFC or something, you would pay the same thing and probably not even as good. Uh, that's yeah. that's pretty good. Oh, well, that's, yeah. So that's... the canteen is insanely high. You know, so like if you spend, it depends on what you eat, man. Because in the canteen, you got honey buns, you got soups, you got rice and beans, tunas, all that stuff, coffee. So I would say like on the land, like on the pound, the biggest trading items that people barter amongst each other will be like coffees and tunas because it's like, mm-hmm. that's like big price. Those are like big yeah. items in the canteen. Coffee like and five dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? Five dollars or tunas or two dollars a piece. You know what I mean? So like on a gambling table, normally like you can see all types of items, you know, like chips and soups and all that. But normally like the bigger chips, you know what I mean? Or people use chips still. But like whenever people are like doing transactions, like, mm-hmm. you know, the inmate population, normally when it comes to like a large amount of money with food, it would be like coffees and tunas. And so for that. a coffee, you need a hot water. Yeah. There's hot water in there. Hot water can be a weapon at some point. Yeah, of course. People don't worry about hot water. Personally. Yeah, I know. Of course they are not. But like, so you can make your own hot water for, or they give it to you or. Yeah, normally, like normally, like the, next to the water fountain, there'll be like a pipe coming out of the wall. Okay. You know, that have hot got water. It, got it. So you can make. Oh, okay. Yeah, got it. Worst got case it. scenario, like I'm a coffee fiend. I drink coffee all day, every day, even in there. Uh-huh. Nice. So like sometimes you go like to spots that it could be broken or they may not even have hot water. So you just have to use the hot water. I mean, it's water pretty expensive. Sink. Five bucks for a coffee. Yeah. I, it, It'll last you a week. A bag will last you a oh, week. Oh, so for full bag, not yeah, just yeah, for yeah. one. No, no, no. I was thinking like. Week. All right. Well, that was great for the prison uh, experience. I want to talk about like. Also a prison, if you don't mind, yeah. like, you know, uh, uh, prison time, you know, I, I know we don't want to talk about the transition and exactly, you know, mm. things because that's part of your story that mm. uh, is waiting for release, you know, mm. but you said you are a rapper, mm. that you were um, writing the lyrics when you were in the prison. Mm. Uh, what is your like target audience or what, mm. what you are like trying to do with, with my music, with the music? Yeah, yeah. So personally, I grew up rapping, right? DMX wore short today. One of my biggest uh, role models and icons in hip hop. Um, so just growing up as you know a student of hip hop, I always loved just the passion. I'm a communicator. I've always been a leader. I've always been very vocal on the football field. I know how to lead people and, and stir people up. So naturally, when I started um, just you know falling in love with hip hop. You know, I was always freestyle and just rap for fun. But when I started um, going to like juvenile programs, I started actually writing. So like that became like an outlet to me. I would write poetry or I write songs. And of course, like I'm a hot headed jit who's living a street lifestyle. So it's all about like selling drugs. But it's also too, it had meaning. Like I wouldn't just like write songs about selling drugs and robberies, but I'd also write songs about like how I felt about doing time or my dad not being there. And I would like release my pain in lyrics. And I remember like uh like in the hood where I used to, you know, be hanging out at and selling drugs at there was a studio. There's like a little like house studio that me and my dogs would go to. 
And so like around like 16, 17, I started rapping in the studio frequently. And I remember people would hear my music and sometimes it'd even be like the old heads that would buy drugs off me. Like they'd hear us all freestyling on the corner or they would hear the music from someone's car. And like even a lot of older heads or even people older than me would tell me, even some of my friends would tell me like, yo, and they would like point out my potential. They're like, bro, like out of everybody else, like, bro, you're fire. Like, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. like you got it. They knew it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I always knew like I was gifted as a lyricist and as an artist, but I just never took it serious. Uh, but throughout my incarceration and especially whenever like I would say like my music didn't have purpose before it was just a means of expression it was an outlet for me and of course I had purpose there's purpose in that of course but whenever like Jesus transformed my life I began to realize the weight and the power of music and I remember when I got out of prison or jail, I bond out of jail my first time is whenever I first got saved. And I'm trying to like live for Jesus and stay out of the streets. I remember that's when Jeezy dropped the recession. It's like in the album he had. And I'm trying to do good and stay out of the streets. But I listen to the recession. I'm hearing all this talk about getting that bag yes. and, and getting yeah. his money yeah. and selling dope. I'm like, dang, I need to go back yeah. to the streets. You know, <laughs> so it was just like, so anyways, what I'm getting at, and I'm not blaming like Jeezy or artists or things like that, but there's influence with words and with music. Sure. And I know that culture is impacted by the influence that artists have. Mm-hmm. So while I was in prison and when Jesus transformed my life, I began to realize that God gave me that gift for music to to impact people's lives. To create different kind of rap music. Because, you know, like for me, like mm-hmm. the main problem I have with rap is because when I'm in there in the hood in South Central and stuff like that, I can listen, you know, like um, NWA. I can mm. I can listen whatever, and it fits the environment mm. because it's about gang banging. It's about it's about violence, you mm. know. But once I'm here in Venice, mm. and everybody's super super nice to me, and all the people are older, I'm not gonna listen to that. It doesn't fit me, <laughs> you know, yeah. because it's all about gang banging, drugs, you know, killing, whatever, mm. and crazy stuff. Mm. It doesn't. I completely quit rap. Mm. I if I'm here, I can listen it when I'm going work out or whatever because mm. you kind of want you know mm. to hear something more. But when I'm here, it's not on my playlist. That mm. definitely like that proves what you just said. But I didn't know how to express it. But you just said it perfectly because mm. no matter where you at, if you would listen it, it you you feel like okay, let's go back to the street mm. and let's make some money doing mm. that doing that old way, the same way how the guys are talking about you mm. know. Uh, that's why I don't. I stop to listen the the hood rap, the aggressive mm. rap. You know, when there's no, there's no. It's normal there to talk about beating women and stuff like. That. I don't mm. want to listen to that. Yeah, it's not the reality. I want to listen. You know, there's plenty of beautiful music. You know, so mm. I'm when you, when your mom told me mm. that you are like doing Christian rap. I'm like, mm. what is Christian rap? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what? Then I listen. And I like one of the clips that you that you have online. She showed me that. Mm. I also watch it later. Because I do videos, mm. I was looking on the whole thing as a whole thing, not mm. just the lyrics, not just the music. But I have to say it was pretty professional. It's pretty mm. good, you know. Mm. You said that you are not even out for a year. I mean, look at other people. They are not even able to put something like this together and they are out their whole life, you yeah. know. They don't do they were not in prison. They are not able to make it as good, you know. Yeah. That's why I really like that, because not even that the lyrics are not BS. But the way how you did that, mm. I don't know who did that for you, if you mm. did it, whatever. It's nice. Yeah. It's something you can show to someone and say, that's what I do. Mm. You want to help me? No. Mm. You want to participate? No. You know, mm. that's why I like. I That's what I like what you just said, mm. that the music can change your actions. Sure. You know, and if you surround yourself with the music and you live in that environment and everybody listens the same thing, how you want to get out? Mm. I mean, you are in 24-7. It mm. lives in your head rent-free. Sure. You know? So that's good. What are your... I don't want to... If you don't want to answer, it's fine, mm. you know. But I, I would like to know, like, what are your long-term goals in, mm. in this? Let's say, where do you see yourself in, like, five years? In five years? Um, number one, God's given me a vision while I was incarcerated. And it's Block Hustle and Block Hustle Entertainment. So, you know, obviously, I, I'm a Christian hip-hop artist. And God's already opening up, you know, many doors for me since, you know, I've been released. I'm signed by the second biggest Christian hip hop label in the nation. 
and that only happened within like you know seven months being home nice and that's nothing you know but the favor of god uh but god showed me while i was in prison and he gave me vision that you know because i'm a communicator i'm an artist but primarily i'm a preacher you know i'm a pastor and i know that hip-hop is a vehicle it gives access it gets people's attention and it's really entrance into communities into culture so i know that you know black hustle entertainment which is my label and that's the long-term vision that as god continues to open up doors for me as an artist in the industry and you know into culture you know and not to be like some cheesy generic kumbaya christian and i think that's something that god really showed me in prison and i think it's healthy that right now i think like the church in america is going under like healthy reconstruction because i think a lot of from what i viewed coming from an unchurched home and upbringing like my perspectives of christian were kind of like lame and whack and cheesy and generic and it wasn't like authentic you know, so whenever like Jesus began to transform my life and I began to see certain Christian hip hop artists who they didn't fit into that mold. They were still like themselves. They still like understood where they came from and they still like, you know, they they were them. They were authentically them and they would communicate their past, where they came from genuinely. And they would communicate the gospel and they would do so in a, a way that would reach the streets and it was culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. And it was wise mm -hmm. and it was effective. And I think that really played a huge part on my life when it comes to anything that I create in my content, whether it be visuals or the lyrics or the music, that I just want to be real with God and as well as with other people. And part of that is, is communicating where I come from and the past trauma and pain and destruction by how God delivered me from that transformed my life. And now I want to help others you know, discover what I found. So mm -hmm. the long-term vision is for God establishing the, the platform with music and not only for me, to, you know, to reach a huge, you know, global level for the purpose of the proclamation of the gospel, but for other artists like myself who are men and women of God, but who intentionally want to reach culture with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and see lives transformed, you know, come up with me, with the label, with Black Hustle Entertainment. But all that's just a platform for one sole purpose, for Black Hustle. Mm -hmm. Now, Black Hustle is the ministry. That's to where we want to be intentionally making disciples in communities and seeing communities transformed, mm -hmm. you know, being in the church and the streets. Mm -hmm. So I'm all, I'm, I'm both, of, yeah, kind, I'm, of, kind of both and using the tools that you got to mm -hmm. influence those people. Because if you would go on the street as a, as a priest, nobody, no one would listen to you. Mm -hmm. And if you would go there as a thug, mm -hmm. no, no influence. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to kind of do both. Mm -hmm. There's one thing I want to ask you, like, mm -hmm. I'm not a person who would believe in, um, in, um, in some guy on the cloud or whatever but i believe there's something bigger than us something we mm -hmm. cannot even understand touch whatever mm -hmm. different people have different take on that of course i 100 don't believe in like um you know the the pope and the vatican thing and all mm -hmm. that to me it's all just like history of blood rape child molestation mm -hmm. all, all this there's a lot of bad things going on people are starting to see what's going on and, mm. and so forth so on i believe that it has nothing to do with the faith that people mm. have those are two different things this is just organization that is capitalizing on the belief of people or whatever mm. especially you like you've seen child molesters in, in prison stuff like that and mm. then you have a priest that is one day a priest and then next day you see that he was molesting a child mm. or whatever right yeah um, do you also like see a difference between like the organization and the faith like itself mm -hmm. like of course yeah, yeah I don't even definitely. know like how to explain what I'm trying to no, say no, but I you, you I know I understand what you're saying and what I would respond to saying is like you have I'm trying to I'm use the illustration right sure and this use a prison illustration all mm -hmm. right you have two guards mm -hmm. you got one guard that is a complete douchebag dude comes in and enforces every rule and it's just trying to just try this this cause chaos the whole day while he's working then you got another officer who comes in he just does a job he's cool he respects people neither one of those officers can communicate entirely for the oh, organization sure, behind them sure, sure. so the reason why i say that is looking throughout church history mm -hmm. man there's a lot of mess man mm -hmm. of course but I think that viewing the faults mm -hmm. of previous or even existing mm -hmm. leaders in the faith of Christianity is kind of like a 
uh, indirect or not indirect. It's a it's an inaccurate mm -hmm. interpretation mm -hmm. of what Who Christianity is, yeah. of what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. So from my personal experience, not only have I seen like God personally in a genuine relationship with God transform my life, but I see like men and women of God that I know personally that isn't like organization organizational church. Yeah. Not about being a building or exactly. being in politics of Christianity, but it's about that they genuinely love Jesus. They want to obey God in their lifestyle, living righteously, knowing Jesus through faith and living it out on their life, but are also loving other people. Mm -hmm. And it's evident and it, it it's trend uh it's translated in their lives of serving other people. And you can see it and you can mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say like uh, I would say like this just briefly about my transition coming home. I do see because I was never brought up in church, you know, so I never really had that church experience. But I can begin to see coming home the the skepticism that people have, mm -hmm. unchurch people mm -hmm. looking at the church mm -hmm. because it can look like business. Mm -hmm. It can look like uh, manipulation. It can look like, you whatever. know, whatever political yeah. agenda. And I understand that. And there is that. There partially is some of that at different churches, and I'm not saying that there isn't, but what I am saying, but that the true essence of Christianity and that you do see it translated well in many churches and many people's lives is people who are authentically being themselves, yes, exactly. who identify that there is a God and that through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, is there not only fullness of life and they're in love with him and want to obey him, mm -hmm. but it leads them to live a lifestyle of serving other people, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not translated like Jesus, 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 and bashing <laughs> someone over the head with the Bible and acting like some weird nut job. Yeah. Nah, as I'm authentically who I am as a man, it's perfect. but I have a relationship love with it. God and he lives through me ministering to others, you know? I love it um, because it's about you and about what you believe in. You have some rules, some moral codes, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not about what some dude in Vatican will say. Mm -hmm. It's about you and your own approach to things. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, if you if people would follow all those steps, I mean, the society would be pretty good, you mm -hmm. know. But the fact that always people are using it for their own interest is what mm -hmm. making a bad name for the whole thing as a as a piece, you know. Sure. Then you have that uh, people who are doing a good thing, even. Uh, because they fuck up in life, but now they do, do mm. good things, you know? I don't really like to talk too much and judge people based on their past mm. because we don't fully understand the consequences what led them to do that, yeah. you know? Like, it's really very easy to say and label the person, oh, he's a convict or mm. whatever. But like, I, that's why I loved your opening statement because they mm. said, I grew up in a fatherless family. Mm. They just, op they just, just this piece by itself opened for me like you just proved what i was thinking you mm. know like most of the people will get there because of this that's why i will not judge you you know and that's mm. why if you would l follow whatever makes you to be good it can be god it can be whatever good mm. fine support that 100 percent. you know mm. so not not everyone who was in the jail look at my tyson he he mm. became he believes in um, in Islam, mm -hmm. you know, just because he was in in prison as well, and he convert, you know, from mm -hmm. Christian to something. Would you say that he's a bad man because he believes in different God? No, mm -hmm. he's a fucking badass man, you know. Mm -hmm. When you watch Mike Tyson nowadays, I like him better than I like him before, you know. He's a pretty <laughs> cool dude, you know. So like, there is a there is a a way. Everybody has different way to to that, you know. And I really like yours. That's why when she when when your mom came. And she talked to me about you. I'm like, okay, I was listening because, you know, I'm no judgments, whatever. Mm. And then she started going, I'm like, yeah, that's the guy I want to talk to. Yeah, It's not like someone who's like, you know, we have we killed 10 guys, you know, it's good. <laughs> and they never found out, you know, yeah. it's not about that. Yeah. It's about, okay, you've seen this type mm. of things, whatever, but that's not who you are. And that's mm. not who you are trying to be, you know. And uh, if there's something else you want to add to that, you, you can. Mm. But other than that, I really thank you for coming and opening up because mm. that's almost like two hours that yeah, you're sitting yeah, here yeah, and no, I, I love it, you know. Mm. Uh, maybe as you move forward with your career or something, we mm. can do it again. We can play some clips or whatever. I would be 100% down to do that. I really enjoy the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I really like that you have some things you don't want to talk about mm. because it's, an, it's important to not discuss everything from your past because mm. there is always, this is the ammunition for the people who would like to judge you based on that. Mm. Keep it for yourself. That's mm. fine. I 100% respect that. 
you are who you are right now and i ha- i wish you a luck on your on your way man yeah bro doing Thank good you, job man. it's an oppor- it's an honor and opportunity to be here bro i greatly appreciate it man can i uh shout out as far as my plugins for music and all that shout yeah. out whatever you want use <laughs> yeah. this yeah bro so um yo you guys go ahead and subscribe to my youtube channel i'll find uh, it out ei the king uh, and also all of my music is on every platform spotify apple you know ei the king um and also too man i'm releasing uh, my first ep was just released and it's actually all about my incarceration so it's called the incarceration ei ei yeah ei the king E I, like this? No E E E E I. There you go. Like that, right? There you go. Spe- English spelling is not my thing. Right there. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, this is the one I I saw the first one and the second one. I like the one from the jail uh-huh. when uh, because I was actually looking at those cells and stuff. But did you see the um the uh, the promotional trailer go back? I think that's the hardest one we got. I think so I think I see them all. You see, they're they're still like kind of played, but. Cool. All right. Um, scroll look. up go up right there go up the one with um 55 seconds that one this one you say that one let's play it it's pretty cool i like the way how we film it too uh-huh. I spent almost half my life. yeah yeah that's that, a promotion that's the promotional video it looks pretty real man mm-hmm. like the way how i look at it i get the vibe from it Yeah. That's what I want from a video uh, like that. Yeah. I want to feel the way how you uh, experience the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's a whole intention and the thing because the EP is is the incarceration. Mm-hmm. So the narrative of the music and of all the visuals is we're walking the listener through my experience of mm-hmm. all the years incarcerated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I also released the ebook as well. There's a the ebook, you know, the first nice. EP is called The Incarceration Part One, The Bid. And the ebook is on Amazon as well. Mm. So yeah, man, y'all run up the music on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, EI the King. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, EI the King, and on Instagram, I'm EI the King underscore. Perfect, man. Yeah, I wish you luck with that and stay out of trouble. Definitely. It's very easy to fall for it. Thank you very much for coming and hopefully again soon. Definitely. Thank you for the opportunity, Perfect. bro. Pokud vás tento díl zaujal, tak tady jsou další díly. A tady jsou další klipy. Mějte se. Thank you.